But then he ended up getting on top of me. And he was big. He was a big guy. Like, even though he was like 50, he was stocky, six foot, very stocky, big bloke. And he's put his whole hand, right, guy, bloke sized hand inside. And I'm in so much pain that I'm trying to move away, like, because I'm in, like, you know, when you're in so much pain, like, you you can't even um, stay still sort of thing. And he said to me, if you move again, I'm going to, and he had his hand around my pubic bone, and he said, I will snap your effing pubic bone in half which didn't knock her out, but then I've got her hair in my hands and I've kneed her in the face three times and knocked her unconscious. And I did it within, before the police could even get to me, like the others. And they've come, right, and they ran at me and they threw me on the floor with such force, my knees dislocated. My knees literally popped around to the side. And in the struggle, it's luckily got popped back in, but I was like, I was like, you know what? I'm tough, but I, all right, all right, you've got me. But so they put cuffs on me, but then I've slipped out of the cuffs and I've just chucked them on the floor and laughed. It's like, you're not really going to get your job, are you? Oh, I've been pepper sprayed as well at this point. What? But I just, I don't, I don't care. Like, I, I laugh. Like, they pepper spray me in the back of a van before when I was already cuffed. And I, they were all choking on it. And I was just like teasing them. I was laughing at them. I was like, you, you're a bunch of wusses. Like, look at they've got working for the police force. Like, you're crying over a bit of pepper spray when you sprayed me in the eyes. Hello everybody, today we have got Corrine, we've got a harrowing story, there's some female incarceration, there is a lot of things that she's gone through in her life that are quite disturbing and before I continue I've got to ask Corrine, do you waive your anonymity? Yes, I do, yeah, I've thought about it long and hard and I, I totally give my permission. Alright, so whereabouts were you raised? Um, in a town called Eastbourne. Um, it's in between Brighton and Hastings. <clears throat> so, Isn't that yeah. a lovely seaside town? It used to be a lovely seaside town. It's not. I mean, it's quite good compared to some parts of the country. Like, I'm not complaining, but it's it's gone a little bit downhill. There's a lot of um, <clears throat> homeless and addiction problems and, yeah, the crime's going up compared to what it was. There's been a few deaths down here as well, like murders and stuff, so... So I know, your story gets, I know your story gets quite dark at quite a young age, but did you have a happy memories of childhood? Yeah, I did. I did. My mum was, the, I couldn't ask for a better mum. I have to say that. She was the best mum ever. And me and my two brothers, I've got two younger brothers, so I'm the eldest of three. Um, and we never, I, I think there was one time we had a fight in the long grass up the downs. Um, and that's the only time that we've ever, we ever fell out. So my mum used to do the best she could um in the situation um we had no money but um I remember I'd get hand-me-downs and stuff but we we still had three meals probably weren't the most exciting but we we ate well my mum would take us out on like three days out like in the summer holidays we'd do like a holiday week because we couldn't afford to go on a holiday we'd go different places in Eastbourne like up the down to the beach take picnics meet up with cousins stuff like that so I did have a lot of good memories in that respect and I was very close to my nan and granddad they they're what gave me my love for animals sadly about three weeks ago I lost my granddad mm. um so that was hard but what did your parents do <laughs> Well, my dad was originally a bricklayer, but he got slip discs in his back. So, and he got, then he, because of the pain in his back, his hips then went and he had to have double hip replacements at quite a young age. I think he was like early thirties. Um, and then, so because of that, obviously we ended up on benefits um, because my dad literally couldn't get out of bed. It was, it was really bad. Um, and then eventually when he recovered, he went to university and he did really well. He got a, what's the highest thing? Distinction in graphic design, graphic design. Yeah. So, but by that time we were a lot older then. Um, but yeah, we didn't have much money growing up, but um, what, what I will say, sorry, go on. You're probably going to ask a question. 
I get oh, carried I gonna... away with my ADHD. <laughs> I love long answers. What I was going to ask next was about what it was like for you at school. Okay, so school was really not good. I remember from infant school onwards, the bullying. Um, there was a girl in my class, I'm not going to mention names. Um, she was really bad. She would physically hurt me. And in so I, I was really short. I'm five foot one now, but at school I looked two years below what I was. So I was an easy target and I was quite timid I didn't like fighting or anything um I didn't stand up for myself at this point in my life I was yeah I was quite intimidated it was, so it started at infant school and it went all the way till I left school at 16. Oh my goodness so, yeah. how old are you at infant school then that's terrible. Young like five about five oh. I think I remember it starting yeah it was I... bad um and then so this girl got away with bullying me. She called me the devil's child. And I heard my mum and dad say, now, this is a very long time ago, like their views have changed. But I heard my dad say to my mum about, well, that's she shouldn't be calling anyone the devil's child. They're Jehovah's Witnesses, right? So I went into school and said, well, you're a Jehovah's Witness. And I got in so much trouble. I got taken out of the class. This girl got given cookies and milk and had a buddy friend. To pair. But I was getting brutalised every day, like abused at school. And nothing happened. Nothing happened about it. I just didn't didn't make any sense. But yeah, that, must that have been was the so, early fr so frustrating for you. And then you got diagnosed with OCD at age 10. <clears throat> yeah, so I moved up to junior school and there was another group of girls. And do you know what? The girl there, still to this day, she put, last night, I don't know if it's because I'm doing this, she popped up into my in my dream. Um, she was awful to me. Like, she'd turn all the other girls against me. I remember crying, going to the first aid room. And, I, you know, when your kid cries so much, they're like, <laughs> and they can't even speak. So it, it was really bad, yeah. Sorry, what was your question again? About OCD yeah. diagnosis. Oh, yeah. So I'm not going to say too much about my family out of respect, but my dad sometimes could be great, but the majority of the time he is a very difficult man to live with. Um, and then obviously the bullying at school. Um, I, at 10, I started to get really unwell, and I think it was mainly the bullying at school that caused it, to be fair, but um, I think I felt like, I thought it was because I was ugly. So in my head, I was a very confused child at this point because I thought none of the kids liked me because I was stupid, because I was ugly. I was dyslexic as well. So that was pressure at school. And it isn't like it is now. There wasn't so much support. Um, and then I started becoming extremely scared of germs. And because you can't see germs, the fear is never ending because no matter how many times I would wash my hands, I was terrified that I was going to kill my mum with germs. I was so frightened of losing my mum. And it was, don't want to get upset, still upsets me to this day because I remember sitting on my bed and praying to God that he'd let me die. Oh so goodness. in the end, it got so bad, I couldn't, I couldn't leave my bedroom and so I couldn't go to school. And, and that's when I ended up going to psychiatrists and they diagnosed me, diagnosed me with um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, the thing is, when you're a child, you don't understand what that is. I was so confused. I didn't know what was wrong with me. Oh, it also caused me, right, to admit to things I hadn't done. So my mind, it's very hard to explain. My mind would know that it didn't do things, but I would have this such a gut-wrenching gut gut feeling of guilt over these things that I hadn't done that I would confess to things I hadn't done like really messed up things as well that I hadn't even my mum knew that I hadn't done them but once I told her the thing that I in my mind had tricked my own self thinking I'd done even though part of my mind it's like a battle in your brain once I told her I'd get a temporary feeling of relief until the next um intrusive they call them intrusive thoughts come in um, so I'd wash my hands till they'd bleed, like literally bleed. I would think if I don't hold my hands under really hot water for 10 seconds, my mum's going to die. Um, and then I, I would also think, this is weird, 
it's almost bordering psychosis. I think this. But I, so I'd be walking down the road, and the stranger would walk past, and I think that they could read my mind. They could tell what I was thinking, and intrusive thoughts would be popping in my head, and I think they're going to think I don't love my mum. They're going to think I don't love my blood. Just I just can't even remember all, but really intrusive thoughts. And then I thought the stranger could tell what I was thinking. It was it was awful. It was really really awful. Um, so yeah, I got I went to therapy, and obviously I was too young for any antidepressants or anything. And it did ease up a lot by the time I got to secondary school. I think by the time I got into year eight, it had subsided, but it did come back with a vengeance in the future. But we'll go into that later. Did you have any goals, ambitions? Like, what are you going to do when I grow up? That kind of thing. I really wanted to be a vet, a veterinary nurse. I knew I wasn't going to make a vet, but that was my dream. And uh, later on in the story, I'll explain what unfortunately ended up happening with that. How did you meet your first boyfriend? Oh. Right. So to paint a picture, I'm bullied at school. I felt worthless, insecure, ugly, and then. So with all them things becomes where well, you've got low self-esteem and with low self-esteem, you put up with what normal healthy mind wouldn't put up with, I suppose. So I, I was about 15, no, I just turned 16. So I was legal, barely. Um, and I met this 18 year old from a mutual group of friends. Um, and obviously I won't repeat his name. He would take me, um, pick me up after school in his rusty escort. Um, but to me, that was so cool. I've got a boyfriend that can drive, like, oh, if someone actually likes me. And he would, yeah, he'd take me out for dinner, kind of love bomb in the way, but I didn't know what that meant back then. So I fell completely in love with him or what I thought was love. And, um, yeah, things... I ended up taking a turn for the worse. He was he was a drug dealer, but it was okay, green and don't know how to word this. Am I allowed to say what it's pills. a thing that you Yeah, pills. yeah, pills. Yeah, yeah. Dis disco so, biscuits. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, we used to call him Smarty back when I in when I was younger. So yeah, um he was selling that. Uh I'd never done anything like that. Um at this point, me and my dad were falling out regularly. Um, so I thought, here's this guy that likes me, he's older. And so I just kind of ran to him for, to, cause I thought, I thought in my head, oh, we're gonna be together forever. I can, he said, I can go and live with him. He lived with his mum at the time. I don't know what she was thinking, letting a 16 year old just move in and, but anyway, so I couldn't live at home anymore because the me and my dad just weren't getting on. It was just impossible. We couldn't live there. Uh, I couldn't live there anymore. So I, first of all, started sleeping on people's sofas, like friends' sofas. So I was pretty much homeless at 16. Hadn't even done my GCSEs yet. I had, so I was still in school, which would make me laugh when the teachers were like, right, I'm writing a letter to your parents. And I think, well, I'm not there. So... <laughs> It's not going to do any good. But um, so, yeah, I was sleeping on people's sofas. And then he was like, right, come and live with me. Um, I was still a, am I allowed to say a virgin? Yeah, so I was still a virgin. Um, and then, so he took, once I had to live there and I had to rely on him and he started to take advantage Um it's his nice side sort of started to evaporate. Um, and so one day he went into the pub and we were drinking. He was drinking a beer. I was drinking a Coke, obviously. Um, and he started to SA me because I was I, I was so young. I mean, I was I, I was legal. But I was so frightened in that moment because people was what people were watching. There were people in the pub, and I froze. I literally froze, and I couldn't say no. Um, and all I could manage to get out of my mumble out of my mouth was, "Can we go somewhere else? Can we go somewhere else?" And so that's what he did. He took me to the back of that rusty escort, and that was it. Yeah, that was that. Um, 
and I remember just feeling like it was I was in pain I was miserable but I had at that point in my mind I had nowhere to run to um, my mum was desperately upset she didn't know anything about that but she was worried about me she used to walk past the school hoping to bump into me but at that point my mindset at that point was all about him that is it, I was so wrapped up in the situation okay so what happens next okay so I was barely eating I was relying on him to feed me but he at this point got me on the pills and the green it wasn't so much green then it was the older version of it if you know what I mean the resin or whatever yeah um so that the pills really messed with my head because I didn't know I had ADHD, obviously. So you're low in dopamine anyway. I was depressed and miserable and the abuse that had happened that night. And then he's given me pills, which magic to me. Like how, and I remember these are my words, how can something that feels so good be illegal? That's that's how young I was. I didn't couldn't grasp the seriousness, seriousness of it. I remember I would be so ill sometimes he would have to carry me in his arms up the stairs to the flat because I couldn't physically walk. Um, and then on the rare occasion, he did get me food. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing, it's so bad. I remember sitting in his car and I'd refuse to do something. I'd actually, for once, refuse to do something um, sexual with him. And he said to me, because I was scared, I was still uncomfortable with it. And he said, "What's?" He said, "We, well, I bought, I bought you food today, um, and I'm not even getting my mon effing money's worth." Um, and I remember it was raining, and I, I looked out the uh, window, and the rain was like hitting the window of the car, and I didn't even want to face him because I didn't want him to see me cry. And I just remember, I, you know, when you silent cry, just tears were rolling down my face. So yeah, that was pretty awful. Um, and then he, when he'd finished whatever he with me, like didn't want me anymore. He just cast me aside and I was literally, I was luckily enough sleeping on a friend's sofa again. And I went to the council begging for help, right? Social services didn't care back then. And they were saying, they told me that I was making myself intentionally homeless, not living at home. They didn't want to hear none of it. And they told me to go and sleep on a park bench at 16. I oh, swear on my God. life, it's all, everything I say in this is all true. And it wasn't till my teacher, a really kind teacher, she, she was always there for me. Um, she actually rang the social services and said, you, you need to help. And because she was authority, they had to listen. So yeah, that's when I got put into the youth hostel. Yeah, things just got even more messy. What was that like? So there's um, there's a certain YouTuber with the name beginning with B who ended up in um, Broadmoor, you know, the criminally insane prison. He's on YouTube, but a lot of people don't like him. He was actually living in there at the same time. So you had all crazy characters. Um, he was quite mean to me once as well, actually. I remember leaving and crying, but um, that's neither here nor there. Uh, everyone was doing drugs like if you not so when I first moved in I was very shy um I tried not to come out of my room uh there were people there monit monitoring us but they didn't they weren't paying attention to anything was going on if I would knocked for example if I'd knocked on one of the so it was like a big house and it'd been converted into like bedrooms and we all shared a kitchen and a bathroom sort of thing so if I knocked on someone's door and said, can you get um, like white or can you get uh, pills or or um, smoke, anything like that? They'd be like, oh, yeah, sure. Like, where's the money? Go and get it. Um, and it, things were a lot cheaper back then as well. So I would, yeah, when I first got there, I was trying to stay on my own. But then they'll keep knocking on the door, like, come on, we're having a party in such and such room. So I went and then started that's when my drinking started really that's from the party in and then it ended up becoming a problem so by the time I was 17 I was and people I don't know people I don't think think pills are addictive but I was addicted like 
it, it changed the chemical balance in my brain at this point. If I didn't have it, I don't know, with antidepressants, if you don't take it, you get a thing called brain zaps. Well, where the um, endorphins were going up so high and crashing so low, it, it, it when I didn't have it, I was getting brain zaps. And I remember I didn't have anything left because I was like TV gone, old video player gone, everything. I just wanted the pills. And when I finally stopped, I was so ill. Like for two weeks, because I was taking them on a daily basis. I could take like 13. I'm, a 16, I'm 16 years old and I could take like 13 within a few hours because my body had got an um, immune a resistance to them. Um, they probably weren't the strongest either, the lot the stuff we were getting hold of. Uh, anyway, I've lost my train of thought now. So well, I've got ADHD, yeah. so my, my Yeah, you're fine. You're doing quick. great. So you managed to get out of the youth hostel and get a flat. Yeah, there was something else I was going to say. Oh, yeah, I was drinking all the time that I got... Um, when I'd been under the influence in that youth hostel i had been s8 or taken advantage of so many times because i was too um drunk to consent to anything um sometimes it was by people the same age sometimes though we had the like there was i did make a certain there was a little click at one point and we had such a laugh like some some of the times were really fun but um there's some crazy stories i remember we were in the park once and we were making a racket and this guy's come down and from the houses like at the back and he's cut he said look my wife's just had a baby you need to be quiet i'm giving you a fair warning we'd all been drinking so it is it is out of order but we so we didn't think we carry we, we tried to be quiet but then it started the volume started going up again next minute you know right this guy quite a big guy as well with a balaclava has come in the park with a massive bit of wood, like, I don't know, four by four. It was huge, though. It was really thick. And he's just swinging it and knocking the fly. Now, I'm so lucky I managed to escape. Like, we were all running. Like, we were kids. We were scared. Like, no one's going to stand up to this guy. But if we'd all run and jumped on him, we'd have got the better of him. But um, so we all scattered. Yes, yeah, so loads of crazy stuff happened like that. And eventually, when I turned 17, I managed to get a council flat and I actually moved out of the Eastbourne area to a place called Handon Park, which is pretty much like it's conjoined onto, so it's not far Eastbourne. Um, and I things settled down a lot. I wasn't around the people. I wasn't taking anything at this point. My drinking had stopped. Um, and yeah, I don't know if the next bit is the first abusive boyfriend. Am I allowed to say that word? Yeah, you see, you got your next one because the first one was bad. So mm. now you've got your next one, haven't you? And he's equally as bad, or is he worse? Uh. Bad in, but in different ways. I mean, the bad thing about the first one was I was so young and naive and, you know, it's that upset me more because I was, you know, it was more traumatic because I was so young and hadn't had an experience and that was my first experience. Oh, that's another thing I'm going to say. So that set me up with a massive problem, which I didn't realise till not that long ago, a couple of years ago, I really thought about why my behavior in my life had gone the way it had gone and one of the things is I then thought that what I was there to do was I was there for sex am I allowed to say that word yeah that's oh. fine okay that's terrible yeah that's that's really awful um, that's how my now that's what I thought how I get a man to love me is giving them what they want and I never had any enjoyment from um intimacy should we say till late 20s and i had no enjoyment from it it was just something i did and i let people take advantage of me so it's yeah so this boyfriend i don't know now looking back on it i'm like what was i thinking i had my own place i was young oh that was oh, hang on rewind a second so i actually when i was in the ymca I got an offered a place at um, a college in Lewis called Plumpton. 
to start training because I wanted to be the veterinary nurse of my dream. But they told me, the, the youth hostel said, if you, because I had to board there in the week and then come back on weekends, they said, if you're away in the week, we'll give your room somewhere else. So I couldn't go. So, yeah, that really took a toll. And then I did try and go to Eastbourne College, but by then I was so messed up with the drink and the, you know, substances that I, I ended up dropping out. Um, right, so fast forward again to this boyfriend. So he had no job. I was working two jobs to pay my rent and to buy food. What? And I had nothing. Some days I didn't eat. What jobs were you doing? <laughs> it's going to sound funny. So I was... I, sorry, by this point, I was 18. Yeah, I was 18. And I worked as a dinner lady um, at a nearby junior school. And I was also a cleaner in another school. So it wasn't making much, but I was, nevertheless, I, I had jobs. I was working and I was paying my way. And this leech of a man who was a few years older than me, so he was about 20, he... <clears throat> I just came in and sucked me dry of everything. Um, he'd, he'd lay in bed and he wouldn't even let the dog out for the toilet. Cause, oh, that's it. I got a dog as well when I was 17. And I didn't I didn't know how to train the dog at this point. It was a very stupid idea. But I, it's my, it was my lifelong childhood dream to have a dog when I was never allowed. So obviously the first thing I did was save £200 together from work and go and get a dog. And because I worked shifts, I wasn't like gone all day. Anyway, so he wouldn't even let this dog out to the toilet. Um, and I'll come back, he'd still be in bed. Didn't bother to do the washing up, nothing. Um, he'd eat all the food and anyway, he was no good. And he would often just disappear for days and just be cheating on me. He was abusive as well. He'd scream at me, shout at me, gaslight me. Um, and in the end, he went to prison and I met my then husband what did he go um, prison for i think he broke into a hostel not the one that i was in but he broke into some sort of hostel climbed up the drain pipe oh my god i've got a story about that actually so he's climbed up the drain pipe and he's got into a window and so he got caught for that stupidly when i was with him he come around to my mum's my mum and dad's um and they said to me well we don't want him here and i stupid and I didn't understand I was like oh well that's sight of all you don't even want to accept my boyfriend so they they let him round so he ended up on a white um come down uh, my brother's in the house about to go to college downstairs and he's walked up to the room and he's on the landing he's climbed onto the shed roof and through the top window and he was looking for the key because he knew my dad had what used to be an uh, Apple Mac computer for his graphic design. My dad luckily had a padlock on his door because he, it was his private possession because he, he didn't have a lot of money. So he's going, to, he's obviously wired. He's going, where's, I need the key, I need the key. Corrine's locked in there. He knew I wasn't locked in there. My brother really calmly, see, I at this point, I'd learned to deal with violence with violence because... So I keep jumping from bit to bit. In the YMCA, I, I, people tried to bully me. And I started to learn at this point to deal with a bully. You had to fight fire with fire sort of thing. I'm not saying that's the right way, but that's at the time how I had to deal with things. So my brother was really calm. And he was like, right, oh, you're all right, uh, mate. Do you want a cup of tea and a fag? And he was like, yeah, all right then. So he managed to calm him down. And then he, after a fag, he went on his way. Um so yeah so that's what he not he didn't go to prison for that incident but he did a similar thing and got caught for it um and i think he'd done other things because the police come and put my door through at my flat looking for him and he was hiding in the cupboard anyway they took him off out i'm all distressed thinking that i love this guy and mm. so he's in prison and when i was at school i was at school with my future husband and he was never a bully to me um we weren't in the same friends group but he gave me my nickname curry and in my yearbook in my yearbook i've lost it unfortunately but i think he's got a copy it says the name curry under my um, picture because when we were in science he was talking about curry and i thought he said kareen so i was like what and then that was how it stuck 
Um, so I hadn't seen him in years. Um, and then, so I went into Tesco's one night. Um, I've been out with my friends. I took my shoes off. So I went in there barefoot because my feet were rubbing. Um, and I've gone in to get a pack of cigarettes and I bumped into him. And I was like, oh, are you all right? Like, how are you? And me having a bit of drink, he came out into the car park to talk to me because it was his break. And I kissed him and we switched numbers. And then within like a month, he'd moved in, but he was hardworking. He wasn't like the others. He was, he was, a, like, he was a decent guy. Um, yeah. So is there anything you wanted to touch on before I move on? I so <laughs> so it was flourishing with him in the beginning was it yeah yeah we um we got on really well um i wasn't drinking i wasn't doing anything i was we were really happy um and then i got a new job i was working as a healthcare assistant at the hospital and i got a few like exams nothing major but you know i was working my way up and then i found out i was pregnant so i would have been just about to turn 20 when I found out I was pregnant. And then, so I told the hospital, because <clears throat> I had really bad morning sickness, and they said, okay, well, don't come in today. And the next day I got a letter in the post, because I was only um, bank staff, they call it. So like, it wasn't a proper cemented job. It was, you kind of go in to cover different people, like people not being there. Um, they'd been promised and I worked hard like I was so hard working and they promised me all this oh you're gonna get a proper job out of it and we're so impressed anyway so I, uh, they said okay don't come in the next day I got this letter and it said um, you can't come back in because we looked at your um, which used to it's a DBS check but back then it was called CRB check and I got arrested when I was 18 and got a caution and they used that as an excuse. But the real reason was because I was pregnant, I was going to be a liability and they didn't want to pay for me. So, and when I rang up about it, she went, oh, I thought you was off because you broke her arm. I was like, and I said, how am I going to get another job? I've got, a, I'm not pregnant. And they went, and she told me to lie to the next employer. And so I was so upset. And do you know what? I was so ill with the first baby, so ill in morning sickness. I didn't even bother to take it any further. I remember crawling on my hands and knees just, Throwing up, I had to go and have an injection to stop me being sick. It was bad, yeah. Oh. But is there anything else you wanted to ask about that? So you didn't have that child? Oh, no, we did. We had that. That was our eldest daughter. We had Summer. And um, that's another. That's after that. Um, okay, so we had Summer. And what I didn't know at the time when she was born I got postnatal depression quite bad because I didn't have my other mental health diagnoses. So they put me on antidepressants and it, it did help. Um, and then so everything was great. We were still really happy. Um, I, But I, where I had the postnatal depression, I started to not want to be intimate. And obviously being young, he didn't understand that it was because of the postnatal depression. So I think he... It, quite hurt his, his feelings um but after yeah after I took the antidepressants I started to get better uh and then I fell pregnant again quite quickly so she was about five months old no sorry no we'd been we'd got married at this point we got married you were what so 20 21 yeah no sorry it's just before we got married so yeah she'd have been about six months old I bought like a, we we were engaged. So yeah, I would have been about 21. Um, and I bought this sort of flowy dress because I thought, you know, I'm pregnant and I'm going to need something that's going to fit over my stomach. And then we went in to have our 12 week scan. And because I wondered why I hadn't been feeling sick. So I thought, wow, this is great. Because I was really scared when I found out it was pregnant. Because I thought, I'm going to be so ill. How am I going to look after my daughter? Um, and I thought, yeah, this is great. I'm not being sick. And when we went into the scan, there was the baby had gone and it was just a sack left. Um, and the woman just told me so matter of fact, it's like, I know I was only three months pregnant, but when you're excited and you, three months of thinking, because I found out very early on, she just went, she was like, mm, oh, no, I can't see any baby. 
So I've walked out, literally stormed out crying, and they put us in the waiting area. So people coming out with their baby scans, and we were just sobbing in the waiting room. And then they've given me this tablet to take to bring on like a uh, miscarriage. So I took that, went home, and it was a couple of days later. My, I think my ex husband was at work at this point. And because he had to go back to work, we had to pay the bills. And obviously, I wasn't working, I was looking after our daughter. And I remember hoovering up. They said, Don't do anything strenuous, but I had to clean the house. Like the baby would be crawling around. And he used to work nights as well. So he'd leave um, evening and not come back till like very early hours and sleep in the day. So I was really quite isolated. Um, I didn't really see any friends or anything. Not because he'd stopped me, but as you get older and all them bad people that are in my life, I kind of drifted away, which wasn't a bad thing. So yeah, I suddenly had this really bad pain. And with, I'm going to be careful what I say here. It was like somebody had turned a tap on and there was clots the size of, it looked like chopped up liver. It was really, really bad. And I, cause I never had a miscarriage before and I'm still quite young and I know you're, you're an adult at that age, but I didn't, you don't have that much life experience, especially when you've been trapped in a dysfunctional world of, that revolves around alcohol and substances, you, you, you know? So I started, to panic but I didn't realize how bad it was and I rang an ambulance and I put uh it was so bad that I put a pad in and they put me on the my, obviously my husband's rushed back and got a little girl um and they put me on like the stretcher bed thing that they put in the ambulance by the time I would got there and they didn't check either they don't think they realized how bad it is they just put me in a side room my whole lap was covered the bed was soaked and that was, it's not far from my, from where I was to the hospital. And then they put, they give me a, you know, what are they called? Commode. And I sat on that and it filled the thing within 10 minutes. It was full, probably less than that. Um, it's, it's hard to remember. But anyway, then I called one of them and I was panicking at this point. And then they were like, oh, crap. Oh, am I allowed to say that? Yep. They were like, oh, crap. Like, And then they didn't say that, but you could see the expression. And then doctors and nurses were running in and out. And I remember I was at this point, I was losing so much blood that I started to feel like I was going to pass out. And I said to um, one of the doctors, am I going to die? And he says, we'll do our, we're going to do our best. But the weird thing is I never had to have a transfusion. So I don't know. But I got rushed into the theatre and had it. I think they call it DNT. I think that's what they call it. And it's like an operation where they clear it all out. I think the tablet that they gave me had, it hadn't, hadn't happened naturally and it caused a hemorrhage, they said. So I recovered from that. Obviously, absolutely devastated. Um, and then, so life ticked on like everything was fine we got married um had friends and family sorry my dad my, my dog is scratching at the door if you can hear a noise um yeah we had friends and family there and then shortly after the wedding we found out that i was pregnant again and i was terrified all the time i kept thinking going to the toilet and checking and once we'd had the 13 week scan it eased off quite a bit 12 week scan sorry I mean so yeah then we had our, our son first well our only son we had one daughter and one son um and I got postnatal depression but this time it was so bad and we I don't know why I didn't think after the last time I think the lot I think when you get to that point of ill you don't even realize you're ill and my ex-husband he didn't click on either he thought I just didn't love him anymore because I was irritable, I didn't want to be affectionate at all. I was very cold. Um, I would. I found it hard to get on with things. I found it extremely hard to get on with the housework. Um, I did do it, but it was just enough. You know, it wasn't as nice as it should be. And it wasn't dirty, but it, it could have been better. And um, in the end, he met somebody else, and um, I got left. And it was a week after he left that they diagnosed me with a postnatal depression. 
but by this point it our marriage was kind of too bad to salvage at that point i think it just how old are your kids at this point so my daughter's four and my son was two no sorry my daughter was two and he was eight months old oh. yeah so i was now postnatal depression on my own and we'd actually moved sorry we have moved literally across the road to a bigger flat at this point i missed that out so yeah that was really bad um and then my best friend had become homeless and she moved in with me and we've been best friends I, when i met her when i was in the YMCA, she didn't live there but that's how we had met um and we've been best friends we're still very very close friends now we don't see each other as much but it's been a long long-term friendship probably one of the only long-term friendships i've had um so she moved in um and my ex-husband was working all the time and he was young and i was kind of left a lot on my own with the kids he would come to, like sit with them for like an afternoon and then this one day that he did take them um because he started to then have them at weekends so i could get a break I then uh, stupidly went out because I hadn't been out in years and had a drink. And the thing is with my mental illnesses, which I'll go into de detail later, alcohol and my mental illnesses is like petrol on fire. It is explosive. Um, so I went out um, and I drank and the kids obviously weren't with me. And then I come in... I remember so being so drunk, I was crawling on the floor. Um, someone, it was actually my ex-husband's mum and stepdad that sinned me in the street and brought me home. And I started having a go at her over certain things that I'm not going to go into. And then um, I shut the door, locked it, and I messaged my husband, I'm going to... so oh, yeah. um yeah. and then I don't, I'm, I don't know i laugh but it's not funny the police then came and at this point now imagine this knife in hand so drunk i passed out with it in my hand face flat on the floor like that thank god because i had the door was locked and i had it in my hand so i was obviously not messing about um so they broke in now i'm such a kind of coma toe state at this point i didn't know who it was so they're all around me and then and that's in my hand so they've kicked it and it's made me jump so i've jumped up at this point and i've just lashed out started punching um and the biggest struggle ensued and there was literally about i'm not kidding six police officers trying to wrestle me i mm. just have when i get in that state i'm like super strength i don't feel any pain and it was, it, in the end, they managed, well, what the woman did, one of the officers, she got on my arm, she pulled it so far up my neck that it severed nerves in my shoulder. And I've actually got a muscle that wasn't getting the messages sent from the nerves and it's withered away. So yeah, that, that's been a long-term a long -term problem. So yes, so I got arrested, obviously, um, and my friends, my best friend at the time, because we were out that day and she'd gone off her own way and I'd gone off my own way. I was in the cells and I could hear this girl. I was screaming and shouting because I was very angry. And this girl in the cell next to me was like, shut up. And I was like, you shut up. And then I was saying to them, can you get hold of my best friend? She's going to be worried. And she and this girl in the cell next to me was saying to them, get hold of my best friend. I'm going to be worried. And I got home the next day and I was like, where is she? Uh, and she turned up looking worse for wear. I said, I was like, where have you been? I got arrested. And she was like, I got arrested. And then we worked out. She said mine was the cell with that she flooded and there was like a <laughs> one of them things that so she was the one we were shouting at each other. We didn't even know it was each other. <laughs> 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 and then <laughs> obviously, because of what happened, social services got called. I didn't drink again. Um, in the end, they signed it off because it was just, you know, it was a just a bad decision that I made. They luckily weren't there and they didn't see anything and I didn't do it again. Um, and then I went out again, but this night I didn't drink. 
the kids were at their dad and I thought, right, I'm not drinking. And I'd actually gone and pawned. Well, I went to the pawn shop and sold our wedding rings, which weren't a lot, but I got a little bit of money and I went out with my mate, best mate, um, on the night that he had them. And that's when I bumped in to... The psychopath. Yeah, the psych, literally psychopath. He's not diagnosed, he's a psychopath. I've done, I mean, I'm not, I am not qualified, but I've done a lot of research into uh, cluster B personality disorders and I've been with a lot of narcissists and I 100% do believe that he is a psychopath from my experience. Was he charming at first? Oh, oh yeah, very. I mean, his own business, had a sports car, like took me out to dinner, proper love, love bond that I... Love bomb to the degree that I had never seen before. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. I've got some exciting news to announce. Michael Francis is coming back to tour the UK in 2024. The remade man tour, the Michael Francis story. Michael Francis, once named one of the 50 most significant mob bosses in the USA by Fortune magazine, and a former member of the notorious Colombo crime family, We'll take you deep into the world of organized crime, sharing captivating tales and insights into the Mafia's past, present, and future. Join us for an unforgettable evening with Michael Francis, the original Goodfella, as he exclusively sits down with myself, Sean Atwood. With me as the host, there's going to be a no-holes-barred exploration of Michael Francis's life, including his numerous arrests and jury trials that ultimately led to his pleading guilty to a federal racketeering charge, a 10-year prison sentence, and $15 million in restitution. You will have the unique opportunity to ask questions during an audience Q&A session, making this event a must-see for true crime enthusiasts and anyone curious about the underworld. Don't miss this explosive In Conversation with Michael Francis. Live on stage in the UK, this exclusive in-person event will be held in various locations in the UK, Ireland and Scotland. Link in the description box below this video if you want to grab yourself a ticket. Back to the podcast. Cheers. He should have had a degree in it. It was that convincing. Um, and then, so when my kids would go to their dad's at weekends, I would go round to his. Um, he did uh, MMA, which is like mixed martial arts and I didn't do anything like that at the point at this point um he was really so what they do these people is they're really nice and then they'll dip their toe in the water so they'll say something like oh no that doesn't look nice on you for example that's how they'll start off like they'll have little digs and if you put up with it they'll go to take it a little bit further and a little bit further and that's how they manage to confuse your mind so that's he started doing things similar to that I can't remember exactly and in the way in a in the end he chipped away at me so much that I didn't even realize what was going on anymore um and one night I was oh sorry I'm skipping ahead again so it started to be really abusive and one another thing I noticed his mum and dad lived in the semi-detached house next door because they owned both properties and he would go in there and they were elderly and he would scream and shout at them and and throw things and I would I remember going around there and going what are you doing you leave them alone come on and then what he'd do is he'd come in and turn on me but I they were old and his mum had got just got over breast cancer I was like how could you do so now looking back on it I should have got my stuff and never come back but I was so entangled in this point um and yeah things just got worse and worse uh trying to mature a lot of it I've managed to block out so I've got to try and I mean there was one incident where somebody that I know had come round that was also a mutual friend and he was bullying them and all I said was come on like leave him alone and that's it he switched on me screaming and shouting um oh sorry I'm skipping ahead again I ended up right that's for everyone I had we ended up having a baby um what had happened was I was on birth control, but I had a problem with my stomach and I had irritated my gut so bad that I, I was vomiting and blood was coming up. Now, I should have thought 
that means the tablets I couldn't keep him down could I and it was literally the month after that I ended up finding out I was pregnant so I was because I just started to recover and it, I remember it was Halloween and I went round to his and that was the day that I'd conceived um obviously I'm glad now I've got my beautiful child my, it'll be my third child um so once I was pregnant it got even the extremes of abuse had like it's now become very violent um he'll break things i was i was quite scared to be honest he was a big guy and he trained like his he he never punched me in the face but i got in contact with the the mother of his first child and at a later date because he told me if i ever spoke to her he would kill me there was a lot of threats a lot of threats um and he'd said the same to her so we were too scared to talk and I was convinced that it was me. Nobody, all the others boyfriends had left me or abused me. Um, and I was convinced it was me. There's something wrong with me. I'm always doing something wrong because I couldn't see what he was doing at the time. And then I remember this one, this one night, that's when the, the mutual friend was there and he was really getting in their face. And I was like, like, leave him alone. And he's turned around and he's gone. <sighs> twice in my face and something's just switched and that's why i've just bang 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 straight in the face and then i picked this wine bottle up it was red wine he had white walls i wasn't going to hit him with it um and i just smashed this bottle and this red wine went everywhere i chucked the glass bit straight away it wasn't my intention to do anything with that and he's ran out the front door and this is when i started to get quite aggressive back with him um and then there was so it was Chris. So fast forward to Christmas Eve. My kids are at their dad's. And so it's going into Christmas night. If that makes sense, Christmas Eve going to Christmas night. And he's what he's done is I was asleep. So my my third child was in the cot at the end of the bed. And he's he's got our child which was about born in July and this is at Christmas. So July, August, September, October, November. So about six months old and he's put her um, her in between us and he's attacked me with the baby in the bed. And I didn't know that the baby was in the bed because I was in the middle of a deep sleep. Because what he'd do, this is another tactic he would use. He would force me to stay up all night he would not let me sleep and I'd be so exhausted in the end I'd fall asleep on the sofa I'm looking after a baby and in the week I've got children as well and I remember it was a cold cold night and it wasn't this night it was another night it was freezing cold night and he it was icy and snow he had opened the patio doors right next to the sofa I was on and left them open and I was so tired I didn't even wake up from the cold for ages and when I did I was freezing and then I went back I went up the stairs um so anyway on this night the christmas night he had attacked me and he what he'd done was in my sleep he grabbed my arms and threw me off of the bed and he landed on top of me and i cracked my head open on the bedside table on the way down i didn't feel that at that time and i didn't know the baby was in the bed luckily baby was fine i was so angry at this point because he had me by my arms I got him, I got my legs, I hadn't done martial arts at this point, but it, it's the only thing I could think of doing. I got my legs around his neck and got him like trapped with my legs, like kind of a bit, I wasn't doing it the correct way, but I got him in sort of a lock so he couldn't move. So we were at stalemate um, and I was going to him, you better knock me out or I'm going to F word, K word you, if that makes sense. And I kept saying it over and over and he he was getting scared and he was like, I'm going to tie you up. I'm going to tie you up. I said, yeah, good luck with that. So as soon as you let me go and I meant it, I was furious. He knew I was I was being serious. So he, he's in the end, he's jumped off of me. I don't know what his plan was, but we were there for ages and I wasn't calming down. And as he's got off, I've run to the corner of the room and he had this big samurai sword. So I go, took it out of the thing. And I had him up against the wall and I said, you ever put your hands on me again? That is it. And I, and I stood there for ages staring him in the eyes because I was like, you're not going to, I'm not letting anyone from that, from that moment on, that's when 
my mind started to <clears throat> I had a violent streak in me now that had started to be unleashed um, not towards people for no reason but mainly towards men because of the abuse that I'd suffered there were some things in my from when I was very young as well that you know that caused me to be quite I didn't trust men anymore I know then I'm not one of them people that think they're all bad I know they're not but the ones that I had encountered because of my poor choices had led me to feel that way so um he was so scared that he ran in the bathroom and he threw up I grabbed all my stuff got in a taxi and went home why I went back after that I don't I don't understand the logic in it but he would ring up and oh, I'm so sorry you know I love you and he would harass and harass and harass until I gave in and went round there and then he'd be nice and then it would go back to and it would just a vicious cycle and in the end um this is really hard and I've got to live with this uh there was a few weekends when my kids weren't going to the dad's and they would stay in his little boy's old room and my son was about two around two and he was quite late with speaking and it wasn't till a year or two well, it must have been about four when he could tell me properly what kind of explain a little bit of what happened when I because he this man would not let me sleep I had fallen in such a deep sleep downstairs that I didn't hear my son crying which I've now got to live with that and I feel extreme, extremely guilty apparently he went in and put um a cover over his head and started to strangle him and bit his fingers now I never saw any marks and then there was another time when they we'd got a a, a, oh God, I speak, a dalmatian and the dalmatian sometimes was clumsy and my son would get knocked over sometimes and I heard a bang in the kitchen and my son cried but he was in there so I thought that, that he'd make sure the dog that I don't even think it was the dog I think it was him and then there was a time with his own our own child so his, his biological child he wouldn't he didn't do the seat belt, belt up and he deliberately put the brakes on in the car and I didn't know I wasn't there so it was his new girlfriend that told me that Bo would come out like banged her face and that's when he he had Bo in his arms could we had split up I'd left at this point he was still harassing me he was sending people to my door to harass me he was going in the shop downstairs and telling them where am I he was knocking on the neighbor's door saying get my get my child and bring it to the park I really want to see him because he was going to try and take him I never put his name on the birth certificate and I didn't for a very good reason because if he had taken our child it would I couldn't have done anything about it because he'd have legal resp parent, parental responsibility so I'm so glad I never did <clears throat> and it, so it wasn't till quite a while later that I found out what he did to my son thank god and do you know what he said it only stopped and he remembers it. it was that traumatic he remembers it from like the age of two and a half he remembers it to this day it said the only reason he stopped is because my daughter had walked in the bedroom what would have happened because he thinks he, he he was so good at lying he could lie his way out in almost any situation he'd either intimidate or lie and he was pretty good at it and he got a buzz out of it like he'd steal from shops and they would know he'd stole but they were too scared to say anything to him that's the sort of man that he was sorry i jumped ahead then so yeah he was going and he was he was going to neighbors asking for them to bring um our child to them and they warned me and I was like I've got to move I have to move um and that's that's what we did and he didn't know where we were and I stopped him having any contact with my children I swear there was something I was going to say and I've missed a bit of it out because I get from going from one thought to another but anyway that's the gist of um that story <clears throat> I did get hold of his ex-partner in the end and she suffered abuse and her physical abuse we got to such a bad level he was beating her when he she was pregnant he was holding weapons up to her now i nipped the physical abuse in the in the bud quite early he knew that i was not playing um 
and I think the experiences leading up to that point are kind of toughened me a bit to not I wasn't scared of this is when I started to not be frightened of people anymore which isn't always a good thing um so yeah I contacted her and she told me all of this and they and she'd had to have injunctions put out on him and that oh and that's this is this is another thing at one point I rang the police when he was harassing me and he'd been coming to my door and spitting in my face and neighbours had seen and this police officer I kid you not what well, two men came round and they were really rude to me didn't want to listen one of them was staring off into space and then I, I rang up another time reported it and this woman police officer laughed at me down the phone when I said he's been spitting in my face again they went what do you want us to do about it arrest him so this is this is important because now not only have I got no faith in men I now have no faith in the police which then leads on to a, a whole load of other issues later on down the line um so I, we got away from him we moved um I did move this is a good thing my dad did do he re my mum had left him at this point um their relationship had deteriorated over the years they were together for about 23 years something like that um and so he'd met someone else who he was going to marry so he switched the house I grew up in with my flat because it we did an exchange and then he repainted that flat and I do appreciate this very much my dad could be all right sometimes you know he did do some good things I can't knock him completely um so he redid this flat and I got the house that I grew up in so that's where and so he then gave the flat up and moved in with his wife um and so yeah I come we came moved to the new house and it was so it was such a relief not having to worry all the time that he was going to be outside because I used to sometimes not be able to go out the house because he was there oh yeah and he did this really creepy thing it's not even funny but he would ring my phone and I would be like oh what's he doing and I'd lo I looked up once and I was in a second floor flat and we had these big windows they they were like they went to the floor that's how um and I've looked and as I've looked up it was like something out of a film he was standing there in the rain ringing me and I was like so I, 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 I was in constant although I was pretty tough I was in fear because I never knew what was coming next so obviously I shut the curtains and then I never wanted the curtains open it was just so anyway we moved and another thing so at this point I've got the three children and I started to get very unwell I would have these manic episodes and I would be cleaning everything talking really fast I'd make out 100 business plans write them all down but never do any of them um I would ring up people and say the same things over and over again and that's when I started going to psychiatrists and they're like right you and I, you've got uh, bipolar disorder and then my moods would dip so low I would literally not want to be here anymore it's got that bad so they put me on mood stabilizer it took them a while to get the right um like dosage and stuff so it wasn't like that was it it went on and obviously I'm looking after little children on my own um which was hard very hard uh and then so when I was with the last abusive ex, the psychopath one, I met, which was my youngest. I know it sounds really bad. I've got three kids by four kids by three different dads, but it is what it is. I just wanted someone to love me. So that's why I would meet these people and then get used. And But I'm glad because I've got my children. Like That's why I said I would never go back. The only thing is I would go back and never let, my other kids go around to this man's house but if I hadn't met him I wouldn't have my other child it's very I try and look at things in every angle possible I don't know but um so I met a friend of his whilst we were seeing each other and then once I'd moved and separated from this guy it'd been a couple of years about four years I think let me think 
No, about about two years. It's so hard to type, could think of the timeline. So it's about two something years. And we got in contact and he we started seeing each other. Now I thought that he actually wanted a relationship and where I thought because of my not because of what he did, but because of past trauma, that that's the way to get that was to give yourself to the person. Um, he, I, I don't know how much I can say. I've got to say some. I had a protection, but he didn't want to use it. He made the excuse that it wouldn't fit. Right, <laughs> um, and uh, something else that was meant to have happened but oops was said after and i fell pregnant um not all to blame i still went along with it it was consensual but i am glad i've got my youngest now um which is the last sorry i keep touching that mic by accident um was the youngest of my children i don't have that's it i only had the i say that's it i only had the four uh and then is there anything you want to add? I've been rambling for ages. No. So this other guy then, he doesn't stay around very long. No. As soon as I found out I was pregnant, within two weeks of finding out, he had got with another girl and he is still with her now. But I was left with three little children, obsessive compulsive disorder, which was there a bit. It wasn't as extreme. Um. It did come back really bad, actually. I missed this bit out when I had my first daughter. I got the OCD and I got the postnatal depression, came back really bad. Um, but I had therapy and it eased off again. So now I'm on my own with bipolar disorder, um, obsessive compulsive traits, because it wasn't full on at that point. Um, and then I've got, I've been left pregnant with three small children, which were, let me think. I was four, so that must have made Ollie six, and Summer must have been about eight, so very young still. And the, and the school, right, so hang on. So one time I messaged him saying, like, I'm in so much pain, because I was hoping that, and I, he didn't buy one single thing for our child. I had to do all of it. And he had the audacity. I got all these really nice secondhand next clothes. But they were like brand new. It was newborn stuff. They And I washed them all and made them all nice. And he went, why are you getting my son secondhand things? But he didn't buy nothing. Luckily, my nan had helped me and my mum. And then one day I was like messing him. I was like, I'm in a lot of pain. Now. And he went, what do you want me to do? Rub, Come and rub your back? I said, well, you didn't rub, mind me rubbing your, did you? <laughs> So he, yeah, and then, so we, we weren't on good terms. So when I gave birth, oh, that's another thing. So when I had, when the psychopathic one, I gave birth to our child on my own, because when I'm in labor, my mum's looking after my other two children. And I rang the psychopath guy and I said, look, I'm having the baby now. And there's some girl in the background going, ain't your problem, it ain't your problem. And he went, good luck. And he put the phone down on me. So I gave birth on my own with just a nurse that I'd just met. Anyway, so fast forward, I'd already been through giving birth on my own before. Um, there was an incident that my childcare fell through. Something went on in the family and the childcare of my three other kids um, had gone, fell through. So my mum, instead of being able to uh, take me to the hospital and stay she had to drop me off and then look after my um middle child the older two were at their dad's so i gave birth on my own again and i was so upset because a few days before i gave birth he had rang me up and asked for a dna test um for all our child and i can understand now but at the same time i was like you're calling me a liar and an s word because I hadn't been there, no one else. I knew I hadn't, and there was no reason for him to think that. I was madly in love with him. Well, I used to fall in love very easily. I'm not like like that now, but I was just so desperate to be loved. That's what it was. Um, so that really upset me. So I was so upset with him. I didn't tell him, and I know it's, people think that it's wrong, but I didn't tell him for a week that I'd had the baby because I couldn't face, I could not face it. Um, I did miss a massive, no, I haven't. 
I ended up going, that was it. So Louis, I've got Louis in that. And I ended up, because of the injury on my shoulder, the doctor put me on tramadol. And I ended up with an addiction and where I had mental health problems and then ended up dependent. And then, so I ended and this is bad, I know, like I had kids and that, but it's my way of dealing with it at the time. Um, I then started buying other people's prescription and then somebody else's. So now I'm taking three lots of what I should be. And I, I remember I used to take 20 tramadol in one go and swallow it. And then one day, went to the school playground. I was talking to the teacher in the playground and as I'm talking to the teacher, I hit the floor and started having like a five minute seizure. And I was going into hypoglycemic coma. If I'd been at home, my poor kids would have seen me die on that floor. Thank God, but this is why I do believe in God because thank God that I was in that playground. Um, and I, I obviously accidentally took an overdose. I, what had happened was I take what I hadn't been able to get the normal amount that I could. So for a good four days, I hadn't had that amount. And then not thinking when I got some more, I took the amount I was taking before and it, I, it overdosed me. Uh, so I went to hospital. I was released later that day. But if they hadn't come, I would have probably said I've probably gone into a coma. My blood sugar got so low. They had to give me this weird thing because when I come round in the ambulance, they were going, do you know where you are? And it's so weird when you have a seizure, you don't you lose your memory. I thought I was 16 again at school. It was so bizarre. Um, oh, I've missed so many things out, but it doesn't matter. So you end yeah. up losing your kids. <laughs> Oh, that comes later on. So I come out of the hospital and that, um, and I managed to wean down the medication, I, and then I'm only taking the amount I'm supposed to have, but I haven't been able to come off it properly. And I went to the doctors and discussed the situation because I was so worried that I was going to end up to get tempted and take more. They put me on what they give heroin addicts, which is called Suboxone. Um, you it which was just bad in itself only because it's so hard to come off of um so I was on that and so at least then I knew I wasn't going to get tempted because it's got a blocker in it so if I'd gone and taken stuff it wouldn't have done anything anyway so it served a purpose and it was it was right thing to do at that time um so yeah I'm so I'm struggling now with four little children mental health problems some undiagnosed still and the school were giving me such a hard time. I remember being so miserable. I thought about chucking myself out the window the top of the, uh, from upstairs. The kids, right, one of my children, and it could be partly because of what happened to him, and I love him to death. He was like a mini abusive husband. He has ADHD, and I didn't know he'd have outbursts of anger. He would smash up the house. He would scream. He would hit the others. I remember trying to bear hug him to restrain him. It was awful. And so I said, I got desperate. And my youngest is getting frightened. So I said to his dad, can you have him for a few weeks? And he had him for a few weeks. And obviously I, I saw him and that, but I would, it ended up him having to stay there, which was the hardest thing I have made a decision I made, but I had to do it because he was frightened and I knew he because he was young it wasn't going to be too much of a transition whereas if I'd sent my other son it was going to cause him and I had the guilt of what had happened so anyway that's the, the decision I made at the time I've still got parental rights I didn't lose custody or anything he's just living with his dad and I see him at the moment they're only allowing me to see him once a month for a weekend but you know it is what it is uh Anyway, so I'm struggling. And I remember this one day in particular, and this went on for, for like years, I was struggling. And it was ice cold. So, you know, I don't know, well, you're going to find out when it's icy and you're trying to push a push chair, it's like, and it's really hard to get through all the sludge. And this, the minibus used to come and pick two of my kids up from the corner. I say the corner, it was like down the road and at a bus stop. But 
my son with the ADHD would keep the others up. So they'd fall asleep. He'd scream his head off and not go to bed. They would wake up and he'd fall asleep. So I'm sleep deprived and extremely depressed. And I've got five. Oh, yeah, I got diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Um, so I'm waking up and when I wake up, I can't move my joints. Like sometimes it takes ages to be able to move. And I remember waking up and I'm all seized up and I'm struggling. And at this point, my youngest hadn't gone to live with his dad. So I put, got hit. They're, they're so tired, these the kids, that they're screaming and kicking and not putting their school clothes on and not eating their breakfast and things are getting chucked and managed to get, and I'm having to feed the baby with a bottle, managed to get him in his little uh, snowsuit, put him in his pram and then I managed to get the kids ready, but we're running late. So I've gone up the road and the minibus, this woman didn't like me. I don't know why she just took a dislike into me. Um, she's seen us running up the road or trying to run up the road with the push chair and she's just wait till we got to the top and she drove off and I've got no car so now I've got to get my mit the so I've got my two eldest that had to go to that school because it was back it was further away and then the other one that's in infant school I've got to walk all the way up down the road and up this big hill which is a half an hour walk in itself so I'm now trying to get him to school and I'm getting hit screamed at clothes being pulled buggies being pulled managed to get him up there and I feel like crying I can't cope with any more of it it was misery and I love my kids I'm not saying I don't but it was extremely difficult I can't emphasize on how hard it was I think somebody who didn't even have mental health problems would have found it extremely difficult so I've got gone into the school and I said I'm so sorry I didn't want to say too much because I didn't want them to think I wasn't coping so I was scared of the social services getting involved. Um, and I said, look, I'm I'm really struggling. I've got fibromyalgia and it's really hard for me to get the kids up and I missed the minibus. And they were really harsh to me. They would not had they had no understanding. They was extremely difficult about the situation and they made me feel like a piece of rubbish. Uh, I just felt. Oh, it's just horrible and they started getting hold of social services because I was late they were threatening me with fines and SBAS and the people would get involved when your kid's not at school it wasn't like I wasn't bringing him anyway so that's shortly after is when my youngest went to his dad because I just couldn't I just couldn't do nothing anymore I was struggling so bad um and then so things started get the house started getting a mess and I'm, I'm just going to say how it is. The kids always had clean clothes and they were fed, but the house was becoming cluttered and untidy. And I was really struggling. I, this is disgusting, but I'm just going to say, I'm just going to say the truth. Sometimes I wouldn't have a shower in months because my depression had got to the point where I just couldn't function anymore. And I said to my mum at this point, and this came back to haunt me, I would rather be in prison than have to live like this. Be careful what you wish for but I will say prison was easier than that than living like that prison to me was easier than struggling in that desperate situation um so then I met my latest abusive boyfriend who I would 100% he is a narcissist um and there's different types of narcissists and I think he's a, what they call a vulnerable narcissist he's he's very insecure some of them are very grandiose they think that they are something they're not this one really insecure about himself um and he projected that onto me so at first he did the love bombing and i hadn't learned any learned anything about how all this works so i again fell into the trap he pretended oh, I'm, i'll help you don't worry i'll go and get the shop in oh i'll help you sort things out in the house and then once he got me hooked and my son really looked up to him and wanted him there because he didn't understand and he'd take him out fishing and stuff and so he did it on purpose he knew that if he made the kids like him then it was going to be hard for me to, to get him to go and then he started to dip his toe in the water he'd uh he'd stopped he was drinking in the evenings 
but it reached a whole new level like he started to try and do it when the kids were up and that's what I really didn't want that like he'd go in the kitchen and do it but you could tell he was intoxicated and he would have these outbursts of anger towards me and I know people were like why didn't you just get rid of him it's very hard to explain when you're in domestic violence and I was already extremely unwell and suffering with complex PTSD and ADHD that hadn't been diagnosed and then all the other things that was going on so I fell into the the hands of and I was literally like a piece of gold to someone like this like that 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 to them was like brilliant like that's exactly the sort of person they go for someone who's in mental health vulnerable it happened it can happen to anyone though but I was definitely an easy target so yeah he started to get aggressive it was mainly mental abuse at this point it was really all the mental stuff and in the end before i go on to the next bit is there anything you wanted to ask me about any of it no i'll just keep going that's great okay so i started to have and i've been at breaking point before but i started to have the biggest nervous breakdown that you can possibly imagine and little did i know the next few years were going to be sorry the hardest few years of my life <clears throat> I couldn't get out of bed at this point my mum was having to come and help with the kids my the doctor said my brain was shutting down um narcissists actually cause brain damage they cause uh, memory loss um I was confused I was gaslit which gaslighting people don't know is they'll do something for example and I will be like, well, like trying to explain, like you've done that, and they'll tell me they never did it, and it's like, and they it, they confuse you. You're completely confused. So I couldn't get out of bed anymore. The school had called the social services because he turned up smelling of alcohol. He promised me he hadn't been drinking that morning, but I was at mine, and he lived near the school, and I was trying to sort get my other child from school. So he picked one of them up, and they smelt alcohol on him. And obviously, quite rightly, they ran the social services. And to be honest, they needed to be enrolled at this point because I was I was unable to cope anymore. I couldn't, I'd given everything I had. Um, and that's when they started to get involved. And But unfortunately, they don't really help. They just observe. So that nothing was really getting done to help. But I was denying any abuse was going on. No, 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 no abuse. Because he'd also convinced me that he wasn't doing anything wrong when it was me. Um, and he met, he used to play on, on, like, he would make me feel guilty. He would cry, oh, I was abused. Um, so he played on uh, guilt. And because of my experience with the police before and things to do with when I was younger that I haven't even mentioned, I had no faith in them anymore. So not only did I feel guilty for this man because he would cry and do all these other things, manipulated uh, manipulation tactics, I was then had no faith in the police. I thought they were going to laugh at me, not believe me. So I never went to the police, which ended up being a big mistake. Um, in the end, inevitably, my eldest two went to live with my ex-husband. Um, oh, he was help. My ex-husband did have his kids at the weekend for all this, by the way. He wasn't just completely not bothering. Um, but it was, I was still overwhelmed. I still had two other kids on the day, so I never got a day off. Um, and then my youngest, unfortunately, went into foster care. But there is good news at the end, so I'll, I'll say that for later. Um, where did I get to? Uh, my mind's gone blank. So you've lost your kids, you were unwell, and then you get going end up in a rehab. Oh yeah. Okay. So the, once the kids went, the abuse got started to get violent, and I've actually got a video of him doing this. And he didn't know I was recording him, and I'm glad I got that video because I showed that to certain people I needed to, authorities that were not the police, but probation and social services in the future, so they could see what I was going through and like because you can't imagine how bad it is till you see it. And that was just a small like five minute video but you got a glimpse um so yeah I've lost the kid I've lost my whole world I've got nothing to live for in my mind I have nothing left to live for I had my house but that was all I had um and this 
So I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't get washed. And this is when I started to not be able to eat. And I'm and people people think you can't live that food. I didn't eat for over two months, about two and a half months. I didn't eat a single thing. And if I did try, I would vomit straight away. It was I, I went and I'm a big I'm big now, but I went from a size 14 at the time down to a size six in eight weeks. All I was living off was Coca-Cola. And that was it. And I was really bad. He'd got me. I made the choice. He didn't force it on me. But I had got on smoking green and a lot of it at this point. Um, I wasn't drinking. And because I wasn't drinking, I managed to hold my temper in. Um, but uh, at this point, the most dangerous person is somebody who has nothing left to lose. And I'm sure like in prison as well, you'd, I mean, you've probably seen this. The most dangerous prisoners are the ones that aren't getting out because they've got nothing left to lose. So they don't care if they uh, bump someone off because they're not going to get anything else for it. So I had nothing left to lose at this point. In my head, I had nothing left to lose. Um, my mum was trying to help, but it's just a desperate situation. So all the services that were involved with me, because there was other things, like I was involved with a place called CGL that try and help people with addiction. I was with a team called Swift, which were absolutely brilliant. They've all been great, who helped with addiction. Um, and they knew I was being abused without me saying it. I could deny it till the cows come home. They could see all the warning signs. And they were like, Let, do you want to go to rehab? And the main reason they were sending me there was to get me away from the abuser. I think because at this point, I still had a chance of getting my child out of foster care. I went to rehab. Um, Hope you're enjoying our podcast. Here's a word from a sponsor, Atlas VPN. This is the best VPN deal in the market. Enjoy the most affordable online protection for just $1.70 per month plus six months extra with a 30 day money back guarantee. Enjoy Black Friday price cut because now Atlas VPN Premium is just $1.70 per month plus six months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Protect your privacy and get many benefits of Atlas VPN for the ridiculously low price. You can take this deal by clicking the link in the video description below. Be quick as it's a limited time offer. Unlock your favourite content from all over the world. Can't access friends or other legendary shows on your Netflix while being abroad? That's not a problem anymore. Atlas VPN got you covered. Hey, the Savile Doc... BBC, check it out in America. Know what I'm saying? Wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your Google searches in private. Looking for something on Google? With Atlas VPN, you can search the web with real and organic search results and do it without tracking your activity. Go away, feds. <laughs> Stop ads and malware. This is more than just a VPN. It blocks all the malicious links, ads and trackers and notifies you when someone is trying to steal your data. And we are inundated with hackers. So Atlas VPN, take that, hackers. Enjoy Black Friday price cut because now Atlas VPN Premium is just $1.70 per month plus six months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Protect your privacy and get many benefits of Atlas VPN for the ridiculously low price. You can take this deal by clicking the link in the video description below. Be quick as it's a limited time offer. And I said to them before I went, please don't send me to one where there's men. I want to go to one where there's just women because I knew that I was a vulnerable person and they agreed that I was vulnerable. So they put me in what they said was a women's only rehab. But it, what it, what it wasn't. One of the houses was women and one of the houses were men. But they got us to mingle in courses. So it wasn't women's only. Um, I, I, um, I'm really sorry. Could I take a minute? Yeah, of course. Sorry, I'm going to make it so difficult for editing. Can I just quickly go to the bathroom? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Go for it. I'm getting you know, distracted. You know, you know what? Um, we're on talking point 17. We've got 35, we're at an hour and a half. Why don't we just stop here and resume it next week? Because I think there's going to be at least another one to two hours. Yeah. And, and I've, I've only got two hours today. I've got to get back to yeah. the baby. Yeah, that's fine. Does that sound um, good? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Um. I think because I'm getting a bit confused with what I'm yeah. saying. I think maybe it's so traumatic, but um, you got you reliving it and everything. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Let's 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 leave it here. Then you can collect your thoughts. Yeah, and, and then if start you afresh. Me, yeah, if you remind me where we left off, then and that'll be great. 
But you're really yeah, good at telling it. It's it's fascinating. You're really good at telling it. Yeah, the viewers are going to be really moved, definitely. Do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me just end the record. When I first got into the rehab after I left the detox, I was I was still really ill for a good a good week or so. It made I was waking up in like pools of sweat. I was feeling awful. Um, and what it was, it's just a, it was like a big house um, and it's got different bedrooms and everybody shared a room with someone. And I actually made quite a good, quite some good friends. Um, a few I'm still in contact with now. Um, uh, basically, I said to them when I went in there, I didn't want to be around any men because I knew that I was vulnerable and I knew that I eat, got easily duped. So like, if you know what I mean, like I'd fall into situations so they said yeah that's fine we, we'll put you in a women's only but then when I got there they had like a men's house like just around the corner so when I was um take your time honestly right remember to breathe so this is going to be a nightmare for editing don't um, worry, don't worry. So they said to me that it would be only women's, but there was a men's rehab just around the corner. Um, and I ended up meeting, um, we because we they put us in, a, they had a hall that we would go in and do like groups. Like so you had to do like every day, you had to get up early, you had to do your chores and you had to go to these groups and like learn about addiction and domestic abuse and stuff like that. So um, that's where I met the guys from the other house because we were all mixed in together and then there was one particular guy he was a lot older than me he was like he was like 50 and he had like big scars across his face and I knew he'd come out of prison but I didn't know what he'd done and me making very bad choices I got involved with this man and like I thought it was all fun and games at first like I didn't think anything bad was going to happen um and we weren't allowed to talk because because we got caught using so in each house you had like a like an old pay phone and you're allowed to use that because they took everybody's mobile phones off of them it's just one of the rules um and they caught us talking because he'd ring my house the house phone and i'd ring his house phone and they someone caught on and like told on us which i was annoyed at at the time, I was really annoyed, like, why are they, like, telling on me sort of thing, like, grassing. But to be honest, the girls were just trying to look out for me, but I couldn't see it at that time. And I wished I'd listened to them. And I feel so stupid for not. But so anyway, he went, they locked me in pretty much. I wasn't really allowed to go out to the shops or anything without someone being with me. I felt very trapped. Um, but he was... I think they're intimidated by him because he was allowed to just like go to the shop, leave that, leave his uh, house and do whatever he wanted. Whereas they tried to like, I was the one that they tried to keep in anyway. So he went and got um, one of these little prison phones. I don't even know why I've still got it. It's a bad memory really. But um, so we were talking on that and he said like, oh, there's an abandoned building. Literally it was out in the country. So it was literally across the road and around the corner, but it was really dark. There's like no street lights. Um, so we made a plan that at like two in the morning when everyone's asleep, he's gonna sneak out of his house and I was gonna sneak out of mine. So I crept down the stairs and they were like really creaky. And I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna get caught. So like I was getting like, a, it's a bit of a buzz. Like I'm doing something naughty. I was getting adrenaline. Um, so I opened the kitchen window, crept out of it, and then like pushed it shut and pulled the curtains back before I shut, pushed the window shut so no one, because girls used to come down in the middle of the night, I don't know why, and start making food at like three, four in the morning. Like there's always someone in the kitchen. Um, anyway, so I climbed out and I went and met, met this guy and we would like talk and that, and we ended up um, having consensual um, in, you know, stuff um and that was it was all fine nothing there was nothing wrong um and then i met and we met another night and then my roommate um caught me on that little phone and i was like oh please don't say anything because they're gonna kick me out and the thing is if i this is this is i'm so annoyed with myself because 
I was so selfish and thinking in the moment that I knew if I got kicked out that they probably wouldn't let me have my son back out of um, foster care. So that, that sort of horrible, selfish person I was at that time. I wasn't thinking about anything than what I was doing in the moment. And I feel so guilty for that. But do you know what? On here, I'm just being honest. Like, yeah. I've done a lot of things that I, I regret. And not everything that's happened in my life is all everyone else's fault. I've made bad choices. But... I also have got very bad mental health problems. So I don't think sometimes I see things the way that other, other people would. It's taken me to now till 35 to actually be able to judge a character and see what someone's true intentions are. Because before it was like, I don't, I, I'm waiting to be assessed um, because I think I might have like mild autism. Like, because I can, I've, there's a lot of things. It's, complicated and going off topic but I have a lot of things like I don't like the, the feeling of my clothes certain foods make me reach because of the texture loud I can't stand being around loud loud noises like there's loads of things and they're not being able to when somebody's doing something for an ulterior motive I could never see what was going on so I was very vulnerable in situations um Anyway, so this third time, the third and final time that I climbed out the window, and my roommate already knew what I was doing because she'd woke up and caught me on the phone. So there was already a risk of her telling on me, but she was like my best friend in there. We had such a laugh. There was some fun times. So I regret this so much. Anyway, so I went out, I climbed out the window and I went and met him and we, it was like there was, it was disgusting in there. It was like there was this old rug, like a vintage old rug. Um, it, it was it was filthy in there. And we had to pull this board off of the window and climb through it. Um, and then we went up like two flights of stairs. But the top floor, half of the ceiling was missing. So it was really dangerous being up there, to be honest. And he brought a candle on that, so we had a bit of light. And he'd, this is the thing, because he was allowed to go and do what he wanted, he'd gone and got a mobile from town. Like, we weren't meant to have phones. He went and bought a whole new, actual, real, proper mobile as well. Um, so he had that for, we had that for a torch. Oh, anyway, so it started off with it being consensual. So the first two the, times... The were, first were, two times, yeah, it was consensual. It was a bit rough with me. It's not my sort of thing. Um, but it wasn't something that bothered me, you know. I, I didn't enjoy it. I don't know. I think it, I, with me, it was more the fact that I was liking having attention. It made me feel wanted. And it, I wasn't enjoying it from... Um, a sexual aspect um but I've always had problems with enjoying things anyway because of things that have happened in the past but anyway so just before things got um sexual he we were talking for a while and one of the things he brought up was why he was in prison and that he'd been in there for um attempted murder um for stabbing his stepdad um in the chest uh and so he brought that up right before this incident. Now, looking back on it, I think he was trying to scare me so that I didn't try and, like, I think he was trying to tell me this to make me fear him. So I'm in, you've got a picture of this, in an abandoned building. No one knows where I am. I have no mobile phone. If I'd screamed, we're out in the middle of the night and no one would have heard. So he's told me all this. Anyway, then he's instigated um stuff and at first i was like like yeah i was going along with it and then he started to get quite aggressive like hitting me in the face um like slapping me in the face and spitting on me and i was like yeah do you know what that that, that doesn't bother me too much i wasn't enjoying it but i wasn't saying no i wasn't saying no um but then okay i'm gonna have to be careful how i describe this Hope you're enjoying the podcast. This is worth my sponsor, Shady Rays. Check them out. Gear up for the season ahead with quality shades built to last. Our friends at Shady Rays have you covered with premium polarized shades and quick swap snow goggles that won't break the bank. 
Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company that offers an unrivaled product that's just as good as any expensive pair we've worn. Durable frames and world-class optics for all outdoor adventures. And if you're into winter sports, the quick swap snow lenses move effortlessly between full sun to low light environments. And these shades hide a multitude of sins since having the little man. Shady Rays offers the most insane protection in all of eyewear. Every pair of sunglasses is backed by lost or broken replacements. If you lose or break your pair, even on day one, they told us they will send you a brand new pair, no questions asked. Wear your Shady Rays with confidence because they have your back long after your purchase. If you don't love your Shady Rays, exchange for a new pair or return them for free within 30 days. There's no risk when you shop. The team always has your back with personal and fast support. Exclusively for our listeners. Shady Rays is giving out an amazing deal for the season. Go to ShadyRays.com and use code SEAN, S-H-A-U-N, for 50% off two plus pairs of polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over a quarter million people. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. Back to the podcast. Cheers. So, yeah, it started with just like the hitting and stuff and the spitting. And I was like, kind of like, I didn't really want to do it, but I just went along with it sort of thing. I didn't say no. Like, so he wasn't really doing anything wrong at that point. But then he ended up getting on top of me and he was big. He was a big guy. Like, even though he was like 50, he was stocky, six foot, very stocky, big bloke. And he's put his whole hand, right, guy, bloke sized hand inside. And I'm in so much pain that I'm trying to move away. Like, because I'm in, like, you know, when you're in so much pain, like, you, you can't even um, stay still, sort of thing. And he said to me, if you move again, I'm going to, and he had his hand around my pubic bone and he said, I will snap your effing pubic bone in half. And um, I thought, right, I've got two options. I go along with it or I fight and end up, and I'm probably going to lose because I've always, this is the thing, I've always been able to fight back. I've always fought back, no matter how big a person is. But I, at that point, I thought, no one knows well no one knows where I am like if he and he's and he's just told me about being in prison for like 12 years or whatever for attempted murder like so at that point I thought you know what I'm just gonna have to close my eyes and just pray that it's over soon and then it got after that he'd done that he then did things in every other orifice that were horrendous he left me with such bad internal injuries that I would I was wet myself for like about up until about five six months later because of the damage the internal damage um and do you know what the weird thing is I tricked my own mind into thinking that that is what I'd wanted I think I couldn't deal with the fact that I hadn't that I hadn't managed to fight someone off because I've always been quite tough like that and I think, so this is, I don't understand this because, well, first of all, he already had my address. I'd stupidly given him my address um, because he was like, oh, I'm going to come down and live with you when we get out of rehab. So me being an absolute idiot gave him my address. So not, I thought, like, he knows where I live as well now. Like, luckily, I've moved now, but at the time, I hadn't. So anyway, so I'd... I've left and I've gone back to the house and I just, it was complete silence in the house as well, like dead silence. And I've just got in, come, gone up to the, to the, um, to my room and I wanted to get in the bath because I felt so disgusted, but I couldn't, everyone would have been like, what are you doing? Like three, four in the morning getting in the bath. So I just laid there in the bed and I just, cried but look it was I was just like complete silent because I didn't want anyone to know and you know what I should have done I should have just gone the next day and told the truth but for some reason I still kept that like I was trying to take the blame for it because we the next day my roommate went it didn't know what happened but she went and told the staff that I'd been going out the window and that's when they were like 
right, you need to be honest with, with us. And um, where's the phone? And we want the SIM card. Now, I've thrown the SIM card, but they thought I was hiding it. So they were um, they were like, right, well, you've, got, you've got to leave. And he got recalled back to prison for two years. So luckily, he got taken out of the situation. But he still knew where I lived. And he still had my real mobile number because I'd given him the number of my real phone. So I've got kicked out. And he's started ringing me from inside prison on my normal phone. And for some reason, I kept in contact, part of me, because he still kept saying things to me like, no one's going to stop us being together. And if they do, um, what was it he said? He was basically saying that if, if anyone tried to stop him being with me, then it's not going to end well for them. That was what he said. Um, so I kept in contact with him for a while. And it wasn't till... A while later, this suddenly hit me what had happened because I convinced myself. It's really hard to explain because unless you've been in the situation, everyone, when something happens like that to somebody, everyone deals with it in a different way. And mine was almost like I was denying it to my own self. I think with predators, they deliberately go for people who are of low self-esteem. So mm. therefore, you are already lowering yourself. So when somebody's abusing you, um you don't you don't go to the police you don't fight back you blame yourself you do all these negative traits and that's why abusers mm -hmm. go for it yeah yeah he definitely knew what he was doing he targeted you because of your low self-esteem at that time yeah it's not your fault um but in the end so he was still contacting me when i when i so I then, so basically, I got sent home. I self harmed immediately after this happened. I um, picked up what was it? Something heavy. I can't even remember what it was, but I I blacked my own eye with it, just because I couldn't cope. Because now I knew that's it. You're not getting your son out of care. It's my fault because I went and broke the rules. They didn't know what a terrible thing I'd just been through. So they're having a go at me. And then I've got everyone else on the outside not understanding why, what I, why I, oh. it was really difficult. So I blacked my own eye and then I started to um, not, do you know what I mean? Like start to, um, and this ended up becoming really dangerous um further on in the story like it gone from black eyes and cuts that were heal themselves to hospital visits and brain scans and stitching and overdoses and all sorts of stuff like that so then so basically i come home now i hadn't drank through all the abuse from my ex i hadn't touched a drop um but once i come out and they'd sat me down and they'd said um, right, you, I'm, we're, you, you've got to go to court and they're going to basically say you can't have um, one of your kids back. Um, it's going to be taken into permanent foster care. And I just... I, sorry. No. I sat there and it was like... I, everyth everything went quiet and it's like I was... It was it was almost out of body. It was like people and noises were going on around me, but I was just not there. And, and that's when something just switched. And I thought, I the, the feeling of despair. I can't explain. Sorry. No, take your time, honestly. The, the feeling of absolute despair. You're not scared of dying but you're scared to live like you don't want to die but you you're just scared to live because the pain is so intense that the only thing i could do because i didn't i wanted to not be alive but i knew that my kids would then be put the pain that i was in i put on them so i was trapped i couldn't even put myself out of my own misery that's that's how my head was at that point so I come out 
and um whilst i'd been in rehab they'd got in my whole house because my ex-partner had smashed it two pieces i had nothing left he broke all of my items he'd like broken the doors ripped lights out the ceiling like it was trash so they cleared it all out for me so i've come back to a completely empty home floorboards no furniture no tv so now i've come out i've got no money yet because my uh, mental health claim was still going through so i've been told i'm not having my children back i've just been seriously essayed it's so bad it's caused internal injuries um i've got the fe guilt the feeling of guilt that's so intense that it just is overwhelming and then i've lost everything i've got no money i can't even go and sit in a house and try and grieve like about the situation because i've got nothing it's completely mm -hmm. empty i've not even got a sofa a bed nothing i had to sleep on the floor on the floorboard so i've gone out and i think i had a little bit of money left and i went and i stupidly took had that first drink and um i was sitting in a web of spoons i had a gin and tonic um i sat away from everyone else just like i was just like <sighs> lost i was so lost i thought how can i come back from this how could it get any worse than what it is the only thing that could have happened that was worse is like god forbid my children are all healthy and safe it's the only thing that could have topped this, that, that situation it's the only thing that could have been worse is if something bad had happened um to them but thank god like they're fine so i then after web spoons i'm just walking around and i walk past this bar and like there's music going in there and i've had a couple of drinks and i thought oh, i'm just gonna i'm gonna go in there and I, I was on my own didn't, didn't know anyone and um i had this great big black eye from where i had um whacked myself and this girl comes over and she's like started talking to me and like got me a drink and we got chatting and that and there was something about her and i just knew straight away that's it we are going to be best friends and i said and we both said we, we that's it and we literally from that moment on we did not separate for like a year it ended up going bad in the end but we had some of the most desperately sad times but also some of the great best fun times it was like a roller coaster it was it was i do we aren't we don't see each other anymore but we were like sisters um we were so close um and you know what if, if she hadn't come into my life at that moment though i don't know if i'd actually have survived because i had nothing and no one but obviously my mum but she was trying to help get my kids together so they can meet in that because they've all been separated because of the situation and my mum's running around behind the scenes trying to help me get my house sorted like but she's also got a lot of trauma that's happened to her in the past and you know she's did, doing the best she could so um anyway so me um we i she come back to mine and we slept on this we had i've got she bought this um like blow up mattress but it deflated in the night so we woke up and we was on the floorboards i've done that many <laughs> times because <laughs> <laughs> we had nothing in the house there wasn't even any carpet to sit on um so yes yeah, so we started hanging around with each other like every day but we started um but i was drinking we were drinking which we used to drink a lot and then i kind of jumped on the bandwagon and the thing is though She's all right if she's had a drink well she can she can be a little bit funny but me if i've had a drink and i'm in a desperate situation it's like petrol on a fire it's dangerous i become dangerous and it's you know it's a good job i'm not a great big bloke because i when i lose my temper i cause mayhem um so yeah so let me think so yeah we started hanging around together and drinking and that and um i that was it then we were, we were walking through town one day and i've seen my ex and he started coming over and shouting that we are lesbians like accusing us of being in, in a relationship and we were just laughing we were like because we weren't we were very close but not it was not in the sexual way oh we we're just really good friends so he's jealous and like screaming and shouting in that and then but i still had no money at this point like i have and it's the winter's coming up now it's like this sort of time and so i ended up me and chelsea ended up 
going round to his house um, because I had no food and stuff. Like, I hated him at this point. I had no love for him at all. In fact, all I had was anger and, um, like, vengeance against him. But I needed him, so I had to use him in a way because I had no food. I had no heating. I had nothing. I had no furniture. So we would go around to his, but he'd be narcissistic and try and abuse me in front of her. But we, we would just literally, we would destroy him. We would just, we would turn it around and we would bully him um, to the point of despair. And we actually... <laughs> We took photos of him and he's like this, like that, <laughs> these photos, and we put it as our WhatsApp picture and we wrote on it, <laughs> oh, I shouldn't say his name. No, no. I don't think anyone would have guessed if you had to point that out, but I'll get that taken out. But so what did you say yeah. your friend coming in? She was sort of like your guardian angel through all the darkness you know yeah. and you had the horrible exes and now you're taking the piss out of him oh, oh we no. absolutely <laughs> annihilated him everything right this is when this is when i've gone from the desperate to the vengeful the evil and the act i was actually becoming extremely dangerous it's escalated uh, to such a big point in the end that yeah so i think that's we, where we'll, we'll end it then because i'm going to bring sean in for the next yes. part because he really wants to hear all the vengeful, crazy stuff. And I don't want to deprive him of that. Yeah, um, it's gonna, this is the bit now that isn't going to be... Like, but a minute ago, it was hard for me to get it all out. But now I'm, now I'm going to be able to tell the story more fluid because it gets so interesting. And it's right, like, right. It's, it, it seems like a lifetime, but it was only it all happened in the like, space of a year. Wow. Or two years, sorry. And it just, yeah, it's crazy. I've got, yeah, really loads right. of funny stories. <laughs> well, let's, I'm going to say this now. Let's bring Sean in now. Okay, so we left off with Corrine whereby things were going to get even crazier. She was not able to get her kids back. So she hit the drink and that is when she met her best friend. So what? thanks for, for continuing this, Corrine. And what happens next? Okay, so me and my best friend met. Um, I did explain, like, so when I got out and they said I couldn't get my kids back, I went and had a drink for the first time in a very long time, um, which ended up being very not a very good idea. So then I was on my own, and then I went to a bar, and that's when my best friend came up to me because I had a big black eye, which I'd done to myself because I wasn't mentally right at this point um so yeah we we would it was it was like we were never apart it wasn't a sexual relationship but it was almost it was more than just a friendship like she'd sleep at mine with me or i'd sleep at hers with her like we were never apart unless she was at work but even then i'll go and wait for her after work so like we were very very close um so because i had no and when i got out of rehab i didn't have any feelings for my ex like it was completely gone i didn't have any love for him or nothing in fact i quite despised him but because i had and this sounds terrible but i had no, no i paid thousands of pounds for him to get out of debt with like rent and stuff so he had his fair share of my money and i had no food no electric my door mm, my door had been put in at some point. So anyway, I had to rely on him for food and not to freeze, basically. So, but he would, he was desperate for me back, but I didn't want him back. So that's when I started to um, be a bit, I was abusive back, I suppose. But it was like, I had so much upset and distress for everything that had happened and I didn't care about him anymore. So when he did horrible things to me, I I did it back to him. And uh, my best friend like kind of joined in. And so I would be at his and he would lock me in the flat and he'd say I wasn't allowed anyone in and I couldn't get out because he'd locked the front door and his flat was disgusting. Like I can't explain how filthy it was and the thing is when he was living with me he'd done the same to mine he would absolutely trashed it so there's this one time and my best friend rang me and i was like i can't i can't get out and i was like i tell you what come and come around the side window 
and I'll open the window and you can climb in because it was the ground floor. So yeah, we were sitting there laughing um, and I said, as soon as he gets in, he's going to accuse. He's. I said exactly what he was going to do because I knew what he was going to do before he even knew it. Um, basically, he. I said he's going to say that he's seen the win, window latch up and that's how he knows before, and that's how he knows she's got in all these times, but she hadn't. He came back in and he started screaming and shouting because she was in there. We weren't doing anything wrong. We were just sitting there having a light bottle of wine. And um, he, he said exactly what I said. He's like, I knew it. I knew it. I've seen the window handle up. I knew she'd been sneaking in. And we were like dying with laughter because I, I literally knew exactly what he was going to say. So he would get drunk and he would physically uh, attack me like quite badly as well. And because I didn't have any love for him now, because that's what was stopping me before, because I, I felt he had me trapped in this mindset where I felt sorry for him and that he couldn't help it. So this one day I was around there and he he's grabbed me like this and pinned me into the sofa. And um, I managed to wriggle out of it. I think I kicked him in the bits and he's gone, oh, I moved back. That was it. And then I got up and I just started, like, really, like, laying into him. Um, and I, I I ragged him around his whole flat. And I and then I got all his possessions like he did to mine. And I smashed them, all of his stuff, all of his things, absolutely smashed his whole place up. And I was like, how do you, how do you like it now? Like, how, how does that feel to have it done back to you sort of thing? Anyway, then I'd leave. And he would always ring the police. Like, I never rang the police. As soon as I fought back, he'd ring the police because he got satisfaction out of seeing me getting in trouble for something that he had caused. A lot of the time, um, she would help me out. Like, I'd, she lived with her mum, but they would, like, really kindly do, like, food for me. And, you know, um, when, my, when I did come into some money later on, I made sure that I repaid sort of you know got things for her to make up for it um so we would do crazy things oh, we'd just be we were crazy we were like two personalities that when we were together was just we were so it was so immature behavior like okay this one time we was in weatherspoons and um we were having like a cocktail now we could drink like fish and so we weren't drunk we only had one cocktail thing to share um, and we were laughing and giggling and being silly. We weren't doing anything wrong, but there was this new um, woman that worked there. And so we've gone in to use the bathroom and we've come out of the cubicles and she's got her hands on her hips and she's like, you two have got to leave. And we were like, why? She's like, you're drunk. And we were like, but we're not. Like, And anyway, so we got in a, a verbal disagreement. So she's like, her and another one started escorting us out and in front of everyone, right? <laughs> I turn around in front of like everyone in Weatherspoons and I've gone, don't sleep with my boyfriend ever again. And she looked like shocked, right? And then my mate's gone, why does she sleep with everyone's boyfriends? <laughs> and we left. <laughs> I thought if I'm getting barred, right, it's going to be for a good reason. <laughs> but yeah, we, we were, I turned into not a, a not very nice person. Um, and some of the things I did do, I'm not glorifying a lot of the stuff that comes in later on because it's out of order. Um, but behind all the joking and the, I think what we do is we do these crazy things. So we had something to like laugh about because inside, um, my friend had a lot of bad things going on as well. So we were inside, we felt like we were dying. Um, and we would, so we would do like, we'd just go on these massive benders and um, we, were the, we were the life of the party. Everyone wanted us in their party because it would just be nuts. So, but in between, whilst this is all going on, I would have, so I'd have mates, I've got bipolar, so I'd go manic, be crazy and do all this um, like mad stuff and then I would go on these massive downers, like, and the self harm would be so bad that I would end up in hospital. Um, I remember, hang on, that comes a bit later on, but I would, um, I don't know how I can say this, 
razors were used um and i would just not go to the hospital and then when i did they'd be like we can't use stitches because it's been open more than 24 hours um and i've absolutely ruined my arm and my legs it's like now i don't won't have my legs out at all so although we were having a laugh deep down it was a horrible time um i'm just trying is to this think a, is so, this around the time that the women with the bricks tried to attack you oh my god right yeah <laughs> so my this is the thing with all my exes they've always used me as a weapon so they drag me into their nonsense like oh, i'll get my girlfriend on you and this and that and i was like what but these two girls right it was a mother and daughter one was 18 and the mother was like in her 40s they were like their proper scumbags, like real nasty pieces of work. They go around terrorizing people. And my ex, I don't know what had happened, but he'd annoyed them somehow. And he was like, yeah, I'm going to get my girlfriend on you. So I'm sitting in his flat and they've come up to, they both got a brick in their hands, like one each. And they've started smashing on the windows going, come out, you F word, B word. Like, come on then, come on then. And they did not think I was going to come out, right? And I warned them before. I said, do not. I said, leave me alone because I'm not right. And she was like, yeah, I'm not right either. And I was like, all right then. So um, and I, my ex knew that I was going to run out. So he's gone and locked the patio door and I've just jumped straight out that window. And I've just, I didn't, I didn't, because I didn't care if I lived or died. So I have no fear of anything. It's a very strange place to be in. When you don't care about living or dying, you have no fear. It's, it's just bizarre. So you, so jumped, yeah, I was just, sorry, you jumped out this window through it. No, I opened it and just jumped straight out the window and just, we just, I just grabbed them both. We ended up on the floor and one of them bit me. I've still got teeth mark scar, but I didn't even realise till later because obviously adrenaline. And one of the, the younger ones going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I only did it because my mum wanted me to. Like, so I let her go. So I thought, you know, she, she's young. Like, and, and so I was just, me and this other 40 year old and because I was at one point because I was trying to fight both of them I did end up on the floor like I'm not invincible and so she's gone to kick me but I've seen it come in and I've blocked like blocked it anyway it went on for a while my ex is coming out trying to drag me apart the thing is though whenever these situations happen my best friend would never get involved but if it was the other way around I'd always jump him so yeah that happened eventually got us apart they did they don't they're not sought to ring the police and neither was I so that was that and they didn't bother me again um what about the furry liquid with the police yeah <laughs> oh no <laughs> right so the thing is i would do things to hurt myself and then people would get concerned and they would ring the police but i hate the police because of previous incidences and because i i wanted revenge on everyone that had done me wrong my ex the police like, er like everyone that had ruined in my head ruined my life and taking everything from me, I wanted revenge. So if the police turned up, I was like, come on then, let's go. Like, I didn't care. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm only five foot one, but they used to have to get six to eight police officers. So <laughs> they've come around. I've seen the blue lights. And I was like, oh, right. <laughs> and I've got this back door with glass panel in it. And so, like, they're outside with the blue lights. And I've just got this vase. And I've smashed the front paint, the first glass you know you've got like double glaze the first glass bit I've knocked out and the second bit I've just gone bam and punched straight through it got glass I've got you can't see it but I've got all scars in my hands so there's blood everywhere going up the walls and then and then I got washing up liquid and I put it because they were trying to put the door and I put it all over the floor and I sat and I was like ready I was like come on then come on then but in the end they they couldn't get through that back door so they came, came around the front and I was sick so I got like by my front door I've got the stairs. So I was on the bottom of the step with my feet against the door, just laughing at them, just just laughing. And I, I was just like, I just didn't, I was completely, I was not right. And the thing is, I went to the hospital and I said to them, I said, please, please section me. I need help. I said, I'm a danger to myself and I'm a danger to others. By this time I was calling, I was, sorry, I need to calm down. Right. By this time, I was causing serious damage to myself. I was end up having to have brain scans, like all sorts. And they said to me, are you hearing voices? And I said, no. And they said, we can't help you. And they sent me away. And they sent me away. And I, I just wanted help. Um, so then 
it was coming up to Christmas time. Um, and me and my, it was Christmas Eve at this point. Um, me and my friend, no, sorry, rewind a few weeks. So just after I'd asked for help and they turned me away, my, I'd fallen out of my mum and it wasn't my mum's fault. I, I was saying nasty things because I was angry at everyone. So she wasn't talking to me. Um, and so, and I had, and obviously I was really miserable because of everything that was going on and I took a massive overdose. And thank God I texted my best friend because she'd gone home and she rang an ambulance and they, I think they must have put the door in, but I don't know because I was hallucinating. And I've got a chimney, like you see that. When I come back after the overdose, right, there was, I wondered why I was covered in soot. Because I was hallucinating and crawling on my hands and knees, I climbed in the fireplace and there was soot all over me, all over the floor. I don't know. And I, because I could hear my ex and my best friend shouting come on what are you doing come on you can walk you can walk but they weren't even there and so I, I was crawling on my hands and knees and I was smashing I was falling and smashing I broke all my nose I had like big black eyes anyway so I went into the hospital and whilst I was there they seen like this massive cut on my leg and there was like it's a bit graphic there was like chunks of fat hanging out of it where it was so deep and they were like, we've got a stitch. They cleaned it all out and they did stitch that one. Um, and then, so I got released. And then a few days later, I was back at my ex's because like, I had nothing. Like my money hadn't been sorted out. I was too ill to work at this point. So I was around his and he started being abusive to me again. Um, and he never learned. Like you'd think that he would think, right, well, I'm going to get beating up back so what's the point but he didn't <clears throat> so he started being abusive and so I just wanted to take I was an alcoholic at this point I just wanted to take my wine and leave and he wouldn't give me my wine now allegedly this is what happened we were trying to fight over this bottle of wine and um I've got it off of him and I've just gone boosh, straight over his head and the, it just broke and like it luckily it wasn't too bad but he, he obviously blood was coming out he had gash he didn't have to have stitches that time <laughs> that time um <clears throat> he obviously rang a police and the ambulance he was all right i wouldn't have even rang the ambulance over that like but that's just me i'm just a bit a bit nuts i suppose um so i was like and all i cared about was great now my last bottle of wine has gone and i've got no money so allegedly I walked into the corner shop and it went ding, took a bottle of wine and walked out and it went ding, the guy around the back didn't even get a chance to come out. <laughs> so there I had, I had another bottle of wine. Um, obviously I wouldn't, I wouldn't take anything now. This is, I can't, I'm not a horrible person, but I was extremely unwell. And that's another thing. I hadn't been taking my medication, my bipolar medication because of my self-harm and that they put me on only a weekly prescription i was so messed up in the head that i didn't just go and get my every week i wasn't going to go and get my medication so i was just drinking and at this point i started doing um bag like white if you know what i mean so i was doing a lot of that my friends would have it and they'd like obviously give me some um and then let me think so all right, so it's coming up to Christmas, and it's like the first Christmas without my children. I have no, so picture this, the door's being put through, I've got no letterbox, it's so all the cold air's coming in, it's December. I've got no heat in, my electric's about to go, and I've got no food, no, and I had, all I had was a phone with a little bit of internet on it. My friend had lent me the money to get this phone. So when me and her had an argument, she came round mine and then when I was asleep she took my phone on Christmas Eve and left so I and so I I do love my best friend but she did some questionable things because I wouldn't do that to somebody because she had a family to go and have Christmas with like she lived with her mum and her brother and stuff so I'm left now on my own just took an overdose like a week or so before with no phone and no food, nothing, freezing. My, my because of an incident, oh no, hang on a minute. 
Right, sorry, <clears throat> rewind slightly. This was just before I did the overdose. Sorry, this is what I mean. It's very confusing because there's so many things that happened. So just before the overdose, I was at mine and my ex was breaking my stuff in my house. Things that I had managed to, like people had given me things. Like I was trying to make it nice, didn't have much. And he started like throwing stuff around and being abusive. And allegedly, I he was shouting and going on and on and on and belittling me and taking the mickey, telling me I didn't deserve my kids and he'd make sure I never got them back. So <clears throat> I've leant down and behind, under the window was like a little coffee table and there was like a little plastic vase with flowers in. It's plastic. And I'm like, I, I, uh, I was like, Ugh! and I've picked the vase up and I and I was facing this way. So I've gone like that and chucked it. So I wasn't aiming at anyone. And as I've thrown it, he's walked into the kitchen door and it's, it's hit him in the head. And um, and I, I didn't, it wasn't on purpose. And this is all alleged, but it wasn't on purpose. But I didn't feel bad for it, that's for sure. Um, and there was blood everywhere. Like it, and he looked, he came up to me and he went, look what you've done. And, you, and I'm not lying, you could see his skull. And I just, and I wasn't even drunk either. I'd only had like a, like one glass of wine and I just picked my drink up and went and took a sip of it right my neighbours have heard the commotion and the police have turned up and they're put trying to put the door in again and I had I had I was hurting myself again because I couldn't cope I could not cope I couldn't I just didn't want to be here but I didn't want to put pain onto my kids so I was like trapped I felt like I was trapped in a life that I didn't want to have and it was a very desperate place. Like, imagine someone taking your Ziggy and saying you couldn't have him back because you'd, like, been abused and, like, had a nervous breakdown. Anyway, so he eventually got in and they had tasers on me and they were like, put, put, the, put the blade down, put the blade down. And um, so I've thrown it to the side because like, I'm sober and I'm thinking I'm not getting tased today. <laughs> and they, there was this one woman police officer and she was about the same height as me. And I was being genuinely honest. I said, if if because they're putting handcuffs on me and trying to wipe the blood off and that and taking photos and all sorts. Um, and they said, and I said, to, if, you, if I'm ever drunk and angry, do not come up to me on your own. I said, because you're quite small. And she went, yeah, so are you, right? So remember that, because later on, <laughs> it comes back into the situation. So <clears throat> I've um, got arrested, got charged with GBH with intent, even though it, it genuinely wasn't intentional. The thing is, his last two girlfriends, I pretty much just before having junctions on him, I had no previous, like, abuse situation. So... But because I kicked off at the police, they were taking his side because they didn't like me, which I can kind of understand. But like when someone's got two ex-partners who have gone through abuse as well, you would kind of think they'd take it into consideration. So CPS put an injunction on me. But <clears throat> so I got like a temporary injunction thing. So I wasn't allowed near him. And even if he apparently if he knocks on my door and I open the door, I'm in breach of it. That doesn't make sense. But that's what they told me. So <clears throat> back to Christmas Day, got no phone. My best friend's not talking to me, got no, can't contact my kids, like not speaking to my mom, freezing cold, starving hungry. I'll get a knock on the door. And I open the door and it's him. Oh, oh, it's okay. I know you're not allowed round, but I've got heat in. You, I've got a Christmas dinner for you at home. I've got your presents. Come on, you can't stay here. I should have just stayed on my own in the cold. But I was in a desperate situation. So I went and he knew what he was doing because he gave me these presents that they were only little things, but he did Christmas dinner and then he waited a little while and he's just turned around when I'm sitting on the sofa and I'm already really like crying and upset anyway. And he's just grabbed me and started attacking me. And the only way I could get him off, because I was pinned in the, like into the corner of the sofa, 
was to um i was trying to punch and i kicked him in the stomach and I, and I bit him to get him off of me oh that's another thing like so years before he'd when i me had had a little bit of a thing years and years before i hadn't mentioned this and i should never have gone back to him because of what had happened then but he'd actually bit a chunk out of my breast um and i i beat him up that time as well but i didn't press any charges so anyway, so I bit him this time because I was just trying to get him off me. And obviously I'm shouting and upset as I leave. I'm running out crying. Um, and his neighbours heard me shouting at him. And his neighbour knows what he's like. But him and his neighbour lied about me. And he put on the tears and the... <gasps> when the police came round, because I didn't know about this at the time, but I found out later on when I got arrested. Um, I knew he was going to ring the police on me because he'd done it before. So I didn't go home. I got hold of my best friend and I was like, look, please, you've got to help me. And right next door to my best friend was our other best friends. Like they lived in a semi-detached. So they knew who my best friend was. So I couldn't go to her. So I went to my other best friend who was next door, who I, they didn't know I was connected to. Um, so yeah, him and his neighbor lied and said that I attacked him and that he was alarmed and distressed and all this. And they took photos of, all things but they didn't take any photos of the marks on me because i not i was like i'm not i'm gonna get arrested so i didn't so i like basically hid and this is when i had a warrant out and this is when i sort of like went on the run for a bit um i say on the run i was like hiding out and um i did go off out of eastbourne as well for a bit so one day i went to go into one of the shops and the woman who uh, works in the gas station she said to me she was having a fag just outside of the gas station she goes don't come in there and I was like why she goes if they if they see you on camera go in they're going to ring the police and I was like what there's like yeah they've been around with your mug shot so they were going around to the local shops with mug shot of me is there and if you see a ringer um <laughs> like anyone would think I was a murderer um so so yeah I was hiding out and then um eventually i was obviously still drinking and partying and that but i was doing it like where they wouldn't find me eventually my money come through um and i said to my best friend right i need to get out of respawn because when they get me i'm going to prison so i'd already i think i wrapped up over 15 assaults on police officers that year there were so many other occasions but i'll be here forever explaining it. i'm just doing the main one so i knew that I was going to prison when they caught me because I knew that they were going to take his side like they always did. So we went off to Brighton and um, we went out drinking and stuff and we stayed in a couple of different hotels. Um, and one of them, the first one we got into, it was freezing. It's like February and there was no heat. On. We were the only people in this hotel. There was no other customers, right? And we were waiting outside for like 45 minutes and we were like r ringing the guy. We're like, where? Like, we're waiting outside. And he goes, oh, sorry, sorry. Came and let us in. We've gone upstairs and we were like freezing. So my mate messaged him. She was like, look, we're, there's no heat in. And he goes, um, what did he say? He said, there's a dry, that there's a, there's a dryer or something, something along them lines in there and we looked because we were thinking like you know like a heat a plug-in heater thing we couldn't find one but we found a hairdryer so we're like why is, is he seriously asking us to warm ourselves up with a hairdryer so we put this hairdryer on and we're sitting there doing this and he told us to to have a warm cup of tea and to use the dry or to use the blower that was it the blower right so we were like and we were my mate messaged me like we don't like tea and this hairdryer is not warming us up and he said oh no i meant i meant the the actual um what do you call them like fan but it's a heater fan um and it and we were like there isn't one so we've heard a little rustling in the room next to us and then a little knock we've opened the door and there's this dryer so we put that on and we were annoyed we were like right we're not leaving at 10 a.m we're staying till 12. that's what we messaged him and he went oh all right then eight in the morning construction work right outside the window like doo -doo 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 -doo. and we were like oh like <laughs> that's why he was like oh yeah it's fine got a bit of my hair sticking up yeah that's why he was like oh advisor. huh five star on trip advisor then oh my god it was so bad so 
So we ended up going to a different hotel the next night, but it was it was kind of funny what happened. And then so we went out drinking. Oh, we bought these matching outfits, but mine was white and hers was black. Um, and then we went into a Morrison's and we to buy a bottle of wine and my mates just grabbed the, t- the tannoy from behind the counter and I, got, I was like great so we've gone running over and we're like bing bong and then my mate's going and if you don't know now you know <laughs> like <laughs> and so like everyone in the shop they were trying to wrestle this um like tannoy thing off of us and I thought I'd paid for the bottle of wine but apparently I didn't so we were like the next day we were like all oh, an accidental an accidental wine stealage like we'd come out with all these like weird little funny things and then um that was it so she started because i was so drunk by the time we got back to this hotel room she was started recording me as a laugh because she used to do that and she's thrown my phone but didn't turn record off and we forgot it was recording so we found like an hour of recording the next day and it was hilarious <laughs> like she made the loudest cup of tea i've ever heard in my life at three in the morning ding a ding a ding a ding she boiled the kettle like three times before she made it um and i when she threw my phone i was like we don't throw phones and then she's like here throw mine and pass me like the um hotel ipad and i was like i might be drunk but i know that's not your phone like it was just so funny anyway so we come back to eastbourne in the end because i was like i can't be like we're gonna run out of money like we had a laugh oh no that was it also that night we were uh, we went into the chicken shop and we was on the tables dancing <laughs> and like the people in the chicken pop- the shop were like yeah like <laughs> cheering us on and then we slipped up and fell off <laughs> so embarrassing it's so embarrassing thinking about it now but we just we didn't care so yeah come we come back and that's when i was due in court for something and i didn't go and then we went out drinking in Eastbourne Town. And um, so basically, we went out drinking and I, as usual, had way too much. And what I'd do, I'd drink. And if I was sick, I'd just be sick, go back out and carry on. Like, I just didn't care. Like, um, so we, as the day went on, because we started drinking, oh no, hang on. Right, so that day, that in, that day in particular, we'd gone out for breakfast before we went drinking and my ex was in there and we didn't know. And he's come up and he's, he used to do this weird, pathetic little face. He'd be like, I'm so sorry, I love you. And he was trying to hold my hand and I was like, get off me, like, leave me alone. Like, leave me alone. Um, and so he, he in temper he got a cup of coffee and i had a lacoste jumper on that i've been bought for my birthday um and he's thrown this cup of coffee all over my 120 pound like jumper and i i didn't retaliate i just said to him can you like make him leave please like that that's that out of order yet again i didn't ring the police and he still had my number and i don't know why i hadn't blocked him i think I don't know. But anyway, he was harassing me all day. And he's like, I'm going to ring the police. I'm going to say you've been abusing me again. I'm going to get you in trouble. And he knew I was wanted. So the more the day's gone on, the more I've been drinking and the more our arguments are going on the phone. Um, now, I shouldn't have now. I shouldn't have entertained it. I should have just blocked him. But anyway, so I'm getting really wound up and shouting down the phone. And this, the landlord to this particular pub's come up to me and he said, you've got to leave. And I was like, after, and I just bought a drink. I was like, after I finish my effing drink, I will leave, like being like rude. And so I stuck down this drink and I can't remember. Oh, he went to put his hands on me to get me out. And because I'm not right in the head, um, I've just switched and I smacked him straight in the mouth. I've got the pub tables and I started launching these tables across across the um, pub um, and he we got into this physical fight obviously he's a lot bigger than me he's got managed to get me outside and he's thrown me on the floor and I was enraged I was like I won't let things go like I don't care how hurt I get I'm not letting it go so I was like come on I was like so he got his wife to stand the doorway now I, I, I don't really normally fight with women it's normal because I feel kind of bad because so I, I feel kind of bad I don't know why because I'm a woman myself but I think because I I know I'm quite good at fighting. Kind of feel like 
I'm out of order if I hit a woman, unless they're like coming at me with bricks, then it's fair game, isn't it? So this woman stand in the doorway, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to hit her. I wanted her husband. He's the one that touched, like, put his hands on me, which he kind of really had a right to do because I was being. Oh, I just swore. Um, anyway, so he wouldn't come out, and I'm getting more and more frustrated. By now, someone's rang the police. So I was like, right, you're not going to come out. Are you sure, right? You're not going to come out. Last chance. He wouldn't come out. So I went around the corner and I think when they showed me, and this is why I remember what happened is because they showed me the next day, the CCTV of it all. So I come walk around the corner, I come back with a brick, right? Started trying to put the window through. Like, so I was going to, I would have climbed through the window. I didn't care. Um, and then obviously the, someone had already rang the police and the police pull up. And it was that woman police officer that I warned before not to come up to me when I'm drunk. I knew I was going to prison if they arrested me. I was really angry. I was crying with because I was so angry. I was actually crying at this point with frustration. And they put the men officers, because I don't think they realised, uh, she must have realised who I was because she had seen me before. But anyway, so the, the two male police officers were about, about less than 10 feet away talking to the landlord and they sent the woman over to talk to me. That makes no sense because... So like, anyway, so she's gone to me. So I was kind of like in the in the corner of like the doorway. So like I was like here and she's like, right, we're, I'm arresting you. And I, and I was like, yeah, grabbed her stab vest and I ran her backwards. And just she's gone down, she's hit her head on the car, a parked car, which didn't knock her out. But then I've got her hair in my hands and I've kneed her in the face three times and knocked her unconscious. And I did it within before the police could even get to me, like the others, and they've come, right, and they ran at me and they threw me on the floor with such force, my knees dislocated. My knees literally popped around to the side. And in the struggle, it's luckily got popped back in, but I was like, I was like, do you know what? I'm tough, but uh, all right, all right, you've got me. But so they put cuffs on me, but then I've slipped out of the cuffs and I've just chucked them on the floor and laughed. It's like, you're not really good at your job, are you? Oh, I've been pepper sprayed as well at this point. What? I just, I don't. I don't care. Like I, I laugh. Like they pepper spray me in the back of a van before when I was already cuffed, and I, they were all choking on it. And I was just like teasing them. I was laughing at them. I was like, you, "You're a bunch of wusses!" Like, look at they've got working for the police force. Like you're crying over a bit of pepper spray when you sprayed me in the eyes. And they put a spit hood on me, so I had pepper spray and a spit hood because I, I, I have that in the past. So I know it's really bad, but I don't think they're even allowed to do that. Oh, what, when I'm cuffed in the back of a van? No. Oh, what, the hood? Yeah, the hood. Yeah. No. They hated me, though. If they, if they, Do you know what? I'm surprised I didn't get tased. I really am. Right, so anyway, so they took me into the cells, and one officer's come in the cell, and I started beating them up. Um, I don't know why they sent another woman in the cell. Like, it doesn't make sense. And... So they got her out of the cell because I think I grabbed her and pushed her into the toilet because that's why they came in because I, I smacked my head off the wall in temper, as you do. Um, so anyway, they had to sit with the door. I, they tied me up, right, like the Joker. They had this belt on me. They had a belt on me, right, that had my like cuffs attached to the belt. They had my knee strapped up, my ankle strapped up. And I'm like that in the cell on the floor and I'm just laughing. And there was this police officer and I didn't like him. Really didn't like this guy and he really didn't like me. So I was just ripping the piss out of him for an hour. Like I'm chubby now, but at the time I was thin and he had quite a fat face and he tried to chisel his beard to like to make his face look chiseled. And I was just being horrible. I was just ripping the absolute piss out of him for ages. And then he got his phone out. I was like, I know what you did. Do you think I'm stupid? Put your phone away. I know you're recording me, you idiot. Like, and I was like, I can tell, I was like, I can tell you're a woman, you beat your wife. Like, I was really being horrible. But like, he he was really like, I know, I kind of deserved it, but he was really like brutal with me. I think that's why I really took a dislike to him. Because um, like in these fights now, I'd get really injured. Like I would, I would get injured. Anyway, so um, I've been in the cell and it was a Friday at eight o'clock that I ended up getting arrested. And I didn't go to court till Monday morning. So I was bored. I was like, please, I was saying to them, please just take me to prison. Like, I'm bored. I want to go to prison. Um, 
so the morning monday morning come and they put me in the van or circo van we went to court um and i didn't i didn't care that i was going to prison i knew i was i wasn't bothered because i didn't have any fear for my safety i wasn't scared of what was going to happen in there and i knew that i could look after myself oh i'm not by any means the toughest and there was people in there that were tough like made me look like small fry i'm not I'm not by any means saying like I'm really tough or anything, but because I've got mental health problems, I don't have the same sort of fear as the average person, like for getting hurt and stuff. Um, so yeah, I went to court, they like sentenced, so because I was, they hadn't caught me for what had happened with my ex when I had to bite in to get him off me. So I got six weeks. I tried to explain what happened, but they wouldn't, this, the judge didn't want to hear it. So I've got six weeks for break. Yeah, I've got six weeks for um, breaking the um, little, whatever it is, the injunction thing that they put on me. And then obviously I was then put straight on remand. So I wasn't released. I was put straight on remand for um, the, a, it was, I've got ABH in the highest category because you get different categories of it. So I've got like category A, um, ABH because it was one like one step away from GBH. But I think because her skin wasn't cut or anything, I think that's why they didn't, um, <clears throat> I didn't do me for that. So yeah, I was waiting on remand and that's when the prisoner story starts. So I don't know if you want to... Sorry, you were on remand in Bronzefield and that's when yeah. you met um, the infamous suitcase killer? Yeah. But we're going to do the prison stories in the next episode. So, Corrine, yeah. oh. tell the viewers then what they've got to look forward to in the next episode. Okay, so... Basically, I'm going to say about what it's like going into prison. Um, what, <clears throat> like, I can talk about anything. You can ask me questions and I can talk about it. But I did meet Gemma Mitchell. Um, she was at the start of this year. I think it would come all out in court. Um, she was the first woman or the first person ever in England to have their court te televised. Um, they just brought it over here because in America they do it. They, they don't show the the um criminal or whatever you want to call them the person who's done the crime but they show the judge handing out the sentence um so i'm going to talk she, about what she done. she was she was the suitcase killer yeah that's what we used to call her in prison mm -hmm. she was the lady who um had killed another woman and decapitated her and dumped her put her body in a suitcase drove miles dumped it and the head had been I think the head was found down the hill of it. Yeah, so I can go in depth into the details of that story. Um, also, I want to talk about trans people. Now, I have a very close family member who is, identifies as the opposite sex, so I am not against um, trans people at all. I Everyone has the right to be who they want to be, and I fully support the family member and always have done. But I do want to talk about situation that happened in prison that put vulnerable women in risk. I want to so I'll talk about that a bit. Um, I want to talk about there's a woman called Verdi Coody. She left her baby for six days while she went out partying, and the baby was found dead with maggots in its nappy. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about what happened, to, what what went on with her in prison because <clears throat> there's a story with me and, that I was involved in with that. Um, I want to talk about the fights. The couple there was a couple of fights that I nearly got in. Like main one main one. Um, I want to talk about, I had did a little protest, um, encouraged a lot of people to do a little protest with me. So that's a funny story. And that's, so I got a nick in, which is getting arrested inside a prison. Um, talk about some of the, just the crazy things that happened in there really. And then the fact that I got released <clears throat> and then went and got arrested again and ended up getting another 14 months. So yeah, I'll talk about that. So, yeah, there's quite a lot of things to talk about. Right, so the viewers have been watching this then. We're at the end of part one with Kareen. Kareen, where can the people find you and support you online? So I haven't posted anything yet. I've just set up um, a YouTube channel called The True Crime Whisperer. And I'm going to try and cover true crime cases. And I want to do a series called Banged Up in Bronzefield. And I want to talk about all the infamous people that have been in Bronzefield, you've got um, Baby P's mum, I think was in there, Myra Hindley, uh, Joanne Dennehy, um, 
there's a lot there's a lot um no it wasn't Myra Hindley sorry it was Rose West so yeah I want to go into tell go into depth about each one on like a little series like one like so Banged Up in Bronzefield one series would be about Joanna Dennehy one would be about Gemma Mitchell like do you know what I mean sort of thing um also got a friend that's going to come on and we're gonna do like a little podcast thing talking about prison and you know things like that so i'm not expecting it to do well but it, you know if you want to come over and check it out and watch then that'd be great so that's the, tr the true crime whisperer so kareen's links and jen's links are all in the description box below this video so check out this stuff huge thank you for coming on and we will get back to you for the full prison stories including the fight with the trans can't wait to hear all the details thanks kareen <laughs> yes. all right thank you cheers Thank <laughs> you.